Good morning from Washington, D.C., here in the United States for the eighth annual Nudge Stock. Happy to take the toss from Rory Sutherland in the U.K. We have an amazing lineup coming to you here during the late morning and early afternoon hours of uh, Washington, D.C. and New York, starting with Cass Sunstein. Now, you'll know him as the coiner of the term nudge. He's got a new book out called How Change Happens. Of course, he's an expert also on norm shifts, and we've seen a lot of that lately. Then Sinan Aral, he's the MIT expert on network influence dynamics. He authored the really widely disseminated study called The Spread of True and False News Online. And he's got a brand new book coming out, The Hype machine. Elke Weber, she's Princeton's noted psychologist and expert on risk and probability and decision making, particularly in the realm of environmental decision making and communications. And, and we've got Eric Johnson. Now he's the longtime choice architecture expert and he's got a new book coming out. He is the director of decision sciences at Columbia University. Plus, we have Tara Austin. She's going to talk to us about how behavioral science can boost creative solutions. We also have BJ Fogg. Now, his name may sound familiar because you probably use his behavior change model, the Fogg behavior change model. And we have Jeffrey Miller and Diana Fleischman, evolutionary psychologists extraordinaire. Before we get to all those, let me just tell you a little bit about the real why and the hidden who. Now we like to call it the real why, because as David Ogilvy, our founder once said about people, well, they don't tell you what they think and they don't do what they say. And you know, he was kind of right. And that's why a lot of research can be horribly flawed. But behavioral economics and behavioral science goes a long way to helping us understand a bit why people act the way they do, why they make the choices they do. And I'm not going to retread that ground of all the experts that you have today, because we see the real why as a species-wide phenomenon. This is the uh, heuristic biases we all use, the cognitive uh, heuristics we all use, the cognitive biases that we get tripped up by. But I'm going to take you down another path. And that is the layer below that human species level of the individuals. How are we wired as individuals to make sense of things, to make decisions? And this is what we call the hidden who. So let's embark. And we've got three new lenses that you can use to bring individuals into a sharper focus. Because again, while behavioral economics tells us quite a bit, it doesn't tell us about how individual reactions change depending on how each of us is wired. And this is a whole new approach. I partnered for more than three years with John Poulston at Cantor. It's now picked up a basket of awards. And you can use this in an integrated approach to better decoding individuals. Sometimes they're humans. So these are the three ways we do it. First is personality, personality trait science. Now, this is not like Myers-Briggs, which is not a science, though widely used in companies. Personality trait science is pretty robust. Thousands, if not tens of thousands of studies across most markets on the planet. Here's an article you could pick up in Harvard Business Review I co-authored with Sandra Matz on how you might be able to use and deploy ethically personality-based marketing. How does it work? Well, the simplest approach is the big five ocean construct called OCEAN for the acronym of O-C-E-A-N, as you see here. Now, the first one is openness to experience. It's not like transparency. It's openness to variety, to experience, to trying new things. Now, each of these is a spectrum. You could be lower, middle, or high on each one of them, and together they create a kind of fingerprint for your personality. Most uh, scholars think that these are fairly well baked in by the time you're in your mid-20s, and they're about 50% hereditable. So if you look at each of these, they tell you a lot about you individually, but together even more. Openness to experience, at one end you could be very traditional, not very open to fantasy and the arts, a sort of lad, if you will. 
or you could be at the very high end, a Richard Branson up for any kind of experience, including space. Conscientiousness at the low end, you're probably more of a Ricky Gervais and a high end, you're more of a Hermione Granger. Extroversion at the low end, you'd be more introverted and that's more like a Bill Gates versus that extreme high end of a Joey Trippiani from Friends. Agreeableness at the low end, eh, pretty, pretty Larry David. At the high end, it's more of a, wow, Jennifer Aniston. Agreeableness at the low end could be cynical, acerbic, skeptical. Sometimes people might even think you're a bit of an ass. And at the high end, you're really warm and engaging and pretty trusting. In fact, you may even be gullible. And then comes neuroticism, often called emotional stability, because we don't want to anger anybody if they're pegging the needle on being neurotic. So putting all these things together becomes really important because there's a huge body of literature and a growing one in health and other domains about the correlations between personality trait profiles and how people behave, how they make decisions. If you take this into account when you're trying to change that individual's behavior, it might just boost your effectiveness. Now, the second lens we use is a kind of worldview. It's cultural cognition. This is evolved from the uh, uh, grid group cultural theory model by Dan Kahan at the Cultural Cognition Project at Yale University in the US. And it looks a bit like this. Each one of us can be mapped to this. There's an instrument we can administer and find out where you sit. Now at the top are people who are more comfortable with a very hierarchical construct in life. They like a strong boss, a strong, clear leader and a clear pecking order below them. At the bottom, their opposites are completely flat, egalitarian. Hey, who died and made you the boss? You're not the boss. And on the horizontal axis on the left are individuals. These folks really believe in accountability and all outcomes are based on what you do, not on the societal constructs, not on safety nets or anything like that. Um, on the far right, communitarians really believe that it is all about community first. Now, where you see the confluence of these forces, you begin to have portraits that begin to flesh themselves out. So on the upper left, the hierarchical individualist is all about free markets, a business and competitive approach to the world, but also on the social side, fairly traditional. And their opposites, for example, in the bottom right, these communitarian egalitarians are completely about social progress, close every gap, inequality gaps of all kind, gender bias, pay gaps, LGBTQ bias, close these, make it fair. And they are very pro-regulation because they believe the markets that the folks in the upper left believe in really can exploit and make the poor poorer. So they they don't really get along very easily on the diagonals on this graph, and they don't change very easily. And if you can decode people, you can be much more effective in actually changing their behavior. Look at how this manifests itself in a place like the US. Just look at it through, say, pop culture. Two TV shows, both shows very popular, modern family, very inclusive, warm, multi-generational, and Duck Dynasty, swamp dwellers who have invented a bird call very, very different. If you look at the heat maps of where these shows are well viewed and loved in the United States, where you see the darker area is where they are viewed and loved. And if you look at them side by side, they're almost negative images of each other. This is but one way this cultural cognition, this worldview manifests itself. But it also, for Americans, you would know this, there's what's called the Cracker Barrel Whole Foods Split. Now, you can see this on maps like this, but it also has huge ramifications and it's being tracked in politics. For example, the Cracker Barrel Whole Foods split has been getting ever larger with every election in the United States. So this cultural cognition can be a very powerful thing and you can even use it to, to, use it to decode uh, employees or your sales force as we've done in one case. For example, if you look at the difference between very junior people in the same sales force, and you notice that they're split largely between the three uh, uh, areas on the left and, and bottom right in terms of their worldviews. But when you get to the very high, 
highest level of sales in a company, you can see an interesting thing happens, that they get completely polarized uh, between the bottom right and the upper left. And these are not complementary views. This has huge ampl uh, implications for managing this sales force. Dan Kahan, who came up with this whole framework called cultural cognition, um, has something he calls the disentanglement principle. He says, don't make reasoning free people choose between knowing what's known and being who they are. In other words, much of his experimentation, his studies have shown that really smart, very literate, even scientifically literate people will choose their identity over the evidence you show them. So if you threaten their identity, it doesn't matter how clear your communications, it doesn't matter how smart the audience, they are gonna give you a surprisingly negative reaction. The third one is called cognitive styles. Now this is really a basket of ways we are wired to make decisions. Here are just a few of them. Locus of control is really the sense of where is the control in your life? Is it outside of you? Is it external? Meaning it's chance or fate or maybe your genes? Or is it internal? Like those people in the individualist sector who sell, you know, I am what I do. I make my own outcomes. This is really important when you're trying to change behavior. If you know somebody is extremely external locus of control, giving them just the information to say, lose weight or quit smoking, that's not gonna work. They need a lot more support and help since they believe that the change comes from the outside and not from themselves. So that's an important thing to know. The second is regulatory focus, and there's even a health regulatory focus. And this is that both a state and a trait, people can be temporarily or as a default, more towards a promotion uh, mindset or a prevention mindset, and it makes a very big difference. A promotion mindset are those who feel it's worth going for it, a little bit more risk perhaps to go for a goal, to go for achievement, whereas the prevention mindset is all about risk mitigation, harm mitigation, don't do anything that might cause a loss. And so when tests have been made about communications, there's some evidence that a gain frame works better with promotion mindset, and a loss frame works better with prevention mindset. So good to know if you can decode people. You get down to the bottom left and how people make sense of what you're giving them in communications. They may be wired to be high need for cognition or high need for affect. They're not mutually exclusive, but tend to go different ways. Somebody high need for cognition really wants more evidence. They're not satisfied right away when you tell them something. They want to probe a bit, ask you lots of questions. They like thinking. Those are high need for affect are far more persuaded by an emotional narrative, especially a visual emotional narrative. And finally, the Zimbardo time perspective tells us a lot about whether you are more wired to be past oriented, nostalgic, it could be positive or negative, present, very hedonic possibly, or future-minded. Now, when you're talking to somebody about taking care of themselves, for example, say getting a vaccine, it matters a lot whether they're completely locked in the present or whether they're future-minded, or even if they're gonna save for retirement. The present-minded person, it's more difficult to move them because they don't really process the future consequences of what they do today. So if you think about, for example, the spread of a disease like COVID, somebody very present-minded is not gonna be thinking about the exponential contagion from a month from now. So these are huge principles that have been there. We have started to integrate them as lenses and had terrific success with boosting effectiveness of communications using them. For example, working to communicate climate change risk or with vaccine hesitancy, where we can decode why people who do vaccinate their children versus those who hesitate to vaccinate their children, how might they be wired differently? It's not just about the information and the education or even in the behavioral science of smoking cessation. We've been able to predict without ever asking somebody whether they're a smoker, with about 85% using a personality study, we can predict whether they are or not. The uh, next one is imagine you are a doctor and you've just 
diagnosed a patient who needs insulin because they're diabetic. Well, did you know about half of people who should be taking insulin don't? It's called psychological insulin resistance. So what we could do is build a simple app that would give the doctor in a very quick survey of the patient much more about that patient in terms of how they're wired and therefore how the doctor might frame the need to take insulin. For example, this health locus of control, internal versus external, just one of the parts of the app. We can also find motivations for people, whether they're employees or a sales force, virtue signaling, for example, something that Jeffrey Miller, who you'll hear from later, is very famous for studying. So there is a challenge with self-report methodology. We've all seen it, whether they're convenient samples or the traditional personality self-reports. And I think we all know what it is. What if you gave this guy a self-report survey? How do you think it's going to come back? Maybe not the most self-aware. And so what my colleague, John Poulston and the Cantar folks have done is reinvent some of the methodology used in the traditional approaches to things like personality to mitigate this impression management and self-report bias. They do it through competitive choice. They do it through using visualizations, things that are very quick and don't force people to think about it very much. And I'll Last, I want to talk a little bit about how pandemics affect our behavior and just one really important aspect, because you'll know you'll hear lots of pronouncements about all this will change, nothing will change. Um, here's something we do know from past pandemics, uh, terrorism attacks, things that scare populations. Um, it divides us and it can divide us along those tribes that I showed you earlier in cultural cognition. But here's why, in part, it's called mortality salience. And that's basically when you remind a population about their own eventual demise, you make their own death more salient, some interesting things happen to people. They become more extreme versions of their prior selves. And that can get quite ugly and quite tribal. In individualist cultures like the US and the UK, it can mean much more nationalist, much less caring about people on the other side of the planet. If you can look at the cultural cognition map, you can begin to see the effects of pandemic on that in that the individualists are very much about getting back and opening up, whereas the communitarians are much more worried about those who are vulnerable. So it also has an interesting effect on consumers. If you dig into the literature, you'll find that mortality salience sometimes lead to increased consumption, especially amongst people with low self-esteem. And it can really skew towards luxury good items, something to keep your eye on and something that's been happening uh, over in China as they come out for a, example. And it can also make people very jingoistic, anti-foreign brands. And so with that, I'd like to thank you. And as we go forward through today, keep your eyes open for the real why and the hidden who. And now it's time to hand over to the famed, the legend, the coiner of the nudge, Cass Sunstein. Uh, hi, everybody. My topic is how change happens. Uh, this is connected with what's happening in the world, both with the pandemic and with Black Lives Matter. It has to do with products as well as national politics. It has to do with local politics and sex equality, too. Uh, the topic is daunting uh, to me, and I was blocked on it until two things happened, and these are both in the nature of stories. So a few years ago, I found myself in a group of about eight to 10 people uh, with one of the world's great athletes. He's very tall. I'm not going to tell you his name and that will become, the reason will become clear in a moment. I thought I'd ask him a question I always wanted to ask a great athlete. And I said to him, you know, if there's very little time left in the game and everything depends on you, it's all on your shoulders, the future of the team, the success, all depends on you. And he's good enough, he's famous enough and talented enough that this is realistic. It really does depend on him. I looked at him and I said, in those moments, are you having fun? 
And he looked around at our little group of eight or 10. He paused and he said to me, absolutely. If there's little time left in the game and it's all on me, that's what I was born for. I'm in my element. It's the best time of my life. If you ask me, am I having fun? The answer is the best fun you can imagine. Now that answer surprised me, I confess. I play a little sport called squash and I know some of the really good players and I wouldn't expect that answer. So about an hour later, I found myself in the corner of the room with no one to talk to. And about four meters away was the great athlete standing by himself. I kind of beckoned him over near a curtain and I told him your answer surprised me. Is, is that really true? You're having fun? And he said, you asked me if when the pressure's on my shoulders, I'm having fun. Do you wanna hear the real answer? And I said, sure. And he said, no, it's horrible. He said, don't get me wrong. I, I know what to do, I'm good at it. And he's famously good at it. But he said, it's not fun for me, it's terrible. It's an awful experience. I can bear it, but that's not fun. Okay. What interested me about this was that he was willing to tell me in private, in, in circumstances of trust, something that he would not say in front of a group of as many as 10 people, one of whom was probably a journalist, and he's famous enough that this would end up in the newspaper. Okay, here's the other thing involving social change that's more political, and it's a study of Saudi Arabia relatively recently. A group of young men in Saudi Arabia who by custom have authority over whether their wives work outside of the home, a group of young men, a large group, were asked in a randomized trial, do you feel okay about your wife working outside of the home? And the answer was overwhelmingly, yes, I'm completely in favor of that, that's a good thing. Then the young men were asked, and what do you think the norm is? What do you think other young men in Saudi Arabia think? in response to this question. And the answer was almost uniformly, overwhelmingly. Oh, other young men hate the idea. I'm very unusual in this. The widely shared view is it's a bad idea. Women shouldn't be working outside of the home. Okay, here's where the experiment got interesting. Half of those young men were corrected. They were told, actually, your private view is the same as the private view of men like you. Your view is widely shared. The other half was not corrected in that way. Four months later, the number of women in the treatment group for whom the general norm was disclosed, the number of wives who were applying for jobs and interviewing jobs outside of the home skyrocketed. Those families in a way went whoosh in the direction of something like sex equality. Okay, these two stories are the same story. They are a story about how what we have inside our heads is often very different from what we're prepared to say publicly and what we're prepared to act on. And I want that to be the first moving part, it's called preference falsification, for an account of social change. This helps explain the unanticipated nature of much of what we've seen of late, including Brexit, including the rise of hashtag Me Too. It helps explain the rise of what, much of what we've seen in the 20th century, including the civil rights movement of the 1960s and the rise of fascism in the 1930s. To vindicate the premise of the enterprise, which is the uh, uh, unpredictable nature of social change, let's just notice that Tocqueville himself said that the French Revolution was anticipated no, by no one. That's Tocqueville at the time. Lenin, if anyone was the architect of the Soviet revolution, it was Lenin. Lenin was shocked by the, by the success and speed of the Soviet revolution. Okay, I wanna to try to explain movements that involve products, maybe the iPad, that involve culture, Taylor Swift, that involve politics, Black Lives Matter, and that involve basically small things that are happening in communities all over the world with four moving parts. The first is preference falsification. The second is diverse thresholds. The third is social interactions. And the fourth is group polarization. Four is more than I'd like, but each of them is blissfully simple. 
the stories I told are stories of preference falsification. And to get a hold of the power of it, the most relevant book on Nazism actually comes from the 1950s. It's about what made Nazism possible. And um, an American of German heritage went back to his country and tried to figure out what made that society go a kind of hor horrifically whoosh direction. And he met 10 former Nazis and he liked all of them. They became his friends. And he asked one, didn't you oppose Hitler? How did this happen? And the answer was very eloquent. It was opposition. How would anyone know? How would anyone know what someone opposes or doesn't oppose? Whether he says he opposes depends on the circumstances. When, where, and whom he's talking to. And even then you must still guess why he says what he says. That is a very eloquent prose poem. And the basic idea is with respect to any number of things, we all have in our heads at least some thoughts that we don't voice publicly, that we may voice to no one, possibly will tell our partner or spouse or our closest friend, but possibly not even that. And that means that the rise of some social change, hashtag me too is a case in point, comes from giving someone a kind of green light or a permission slip to say what's actually inside their minds. We all live in a state of pluralistic ignorance, as it's called, in which we don't know what other people think. We just don't. And once they disclose what they think, it might be that we'll start doing or so saying something very different. The fact is that even in the most democratic and freest of societies, people are often silenced by social norms and a perception of what other think, others think. And a green light coming from an interviewer in Saudi Arabia or a apparently trustworthy law professor near a curtain inside a large room can liberate someone to say or do something that they wouldn't otherwise say or do. Okay, the second moving part also comes from a personal story, and this is Diverse Thresholds, slightly embarrassing story. I found myself a few years ago in a dangerous part of the world where no one spoke English. And I walked with a friend who was Irish American, I wanna emphasize the word Irish in that because it's relevant, in a street which was um, mildly frightening and which had no English speakers. About 200 meters from where we were walking, we saw a man beating up his son. Son was about 10 years old and he was just pummeling the son. Before I could register what happened, my friend had run those 200 meters as if he was an Olympic athlete, though he wasn't, he ran fast and started yelling in English at the father, stop beating up your son. And while I much doubt that the father understood English, he understood the emotion. And I was right behind my friend. He went first, I went second. And the father looked initially startled and then abashed and raised his hands as if to say peace and looked a little ashamed and put his arm around his son and walked off gently. In that story, my Irish American friend had a threshold of zero in order to say and act. He needed nothing. He was there. Some people in response to a product or an injustice or something need no one else. Their threshold is nothing. Others are like yours truly in this story. They are ones they need, and I think I probably did need him to go first, but they will follow the ones. Others are twos, and because I was an English major rather than a quantitative anything major, I'm not going to do any math except to say that the end point is infinity. The infinites are very interesting. They won't move at all, either because they are frightened or busy or perhaps just because they're really loyal. Now, this tale of diverse thresholds is a tale of the fall of communism in part. It's certainly the tale of the American Revolution uh, from the location of which I'm speaking now. And notice, if you would, that with diverse thresholds, things can go very fast or not at all, 
depending on who sees whom and exactly when. That point suggests the importance of my third moving part of the four, which is social interactions. Here's just a quotation from someone involved in hashtag me too, broadly understood. And it's a woman named Beverly Johnson who accused a Republican Senate candidate, a politician of having sexually assaulted her. And the accusation was very credible because she was one of a large number. What she said in a kind of introspective moment, a quiet moment was, I thought I was his only victim. I would probably have taken what he did to me to my grave had it not been for the courage of the four other women who were willing to speak out, their courage has enabled me to overcome my fear. Okay, we can think of that as suggesting that if the zeros go first and the ones see them and the twos see them and the threes see them and the fours see them, we can have a massively successful musician or actor or cause we can have Brexit, we can have contemporary populism, we can have Black Lives Matter. But if the twos don't see the ones, or if the fives don't see the fours, or if serendipitously someone is invisible or scared at just the right time, then we will never see the relevant matter in the history books. Okay, the fourth of my moving parts is group polarization. So we've now talked about preference falsification. We've talked about diverse thresholds. We've talked about social interactions. Now group polarization is also illustrated by a story, which is an experiment that startled me that I was involved in, in, uh, in about 15 years ago. In the, in the experiment, we got a bunch of people who were left of center together to talk about whether there should be a treaty to control climate change. And we got a bunch of people right of center to talk about the same thing. The left of center people talked with the left of center people, the right of center people talked to the right of center people. So there's no mixing. What we did was we asked people to say anonymously and privately what their views were on an international treaty then to reach a group verdict, and then to say again what they thought anonymously and privately. What I was interested in is what would happen to their anonymous private statements after talking with each other? And what happened was very simple and to me astonishing. While the left of center people were on balance in favor of the treaty and the right of center people against it, after they talked to each other, there was no talking about on balance. The people who were left of center ended up unified, confident, and extreme. There was some diversity and ambivalence before they talked to each other. After when they talked to each other, they went whoosh. They wanted that Paris Agreement yesterday. The right of center people also went whoosh, but in exactly the opposite direction. They had some interest in an international treaty. Some of them were concerned about greenhouse gas emissions. After they talked, not so. They thought the idea of a treaty was a terrible idea. It would hurt the world. Okay, the basic idea is like-minded people engaged in discussions with each other typically end up in a more extreme point in line with what they thought before they started to talk. And we were observing this every minute of every day on Facebook, on Twitter, and in some places within communities. Okay, now you have the four moving parts, preference falsification, diverse thresholds, social interactions, and group polarization. They help explain, let's call the Tocqueville-Lenin puzzle, which is why people who were there contemporaneously were startled by social upheaval. And they also give a clue about how to make change happen, whether we're talking about selling a product, talking about uh, promoting literature, talking about a cause, or talking about something in culture. There's an authoritarian government, I'll name it on request, but there's an authoritarian government that is showing uh, keen awareness of everything I've described 
they allow a lot of online disagreement and dissent. But if there is online disagreement and dissent that says, let's meet on a specific street at a specific time, let's all go there, that's shut down. That's because of the government's alertness to the power of group polarization and the possibility of overcoming high thresholds. For marketing, this often works. Recent research suggests identification of a new or emerging norm can help breed environmentally friendly behavior. Not to say it's the current norm, but to say people are increasingly doing the following. And if you want to take action to prevent police abuse in various parts of the world, that's an entree. I have left a number of things out and I'm gonna talk about just one. In North Korea, very recently, a woman said, it never occurred to me that I could or would want to do anything about it. It was just how things are. The most important word in that is the word want. It would never occur to me that I could or would want to do anything about it. The basic idea there is that desires themselves are often malleable and giving opportunities sometimes frees people up. The closing words come from a computer program in Syria before the revolution and rebellion there. And what the computer programmer said was, in a kind of summary of what I've tried to sketch, is this. When you meet somebody coming out of Syria for the first time, you start to hear the same sentences, that everything is okay, that the economy is good in Syria, that everything's fine. It'll take like six months up to a year for him to become a normal human being, to say what he thinks, what he feels. Then they might start whispering. They won't speak loudly, but eventually they're going to. Thanks. Terrific, Cass. Thank you for that. And for everybody watching, this is also from his new book, How Change Happens, which I have and recommend. I've got some quick questions and a couple, I think, off of Slido. Um, first of all, um, it seems with preference falsification, there are many of us as humans who are a bit timid or insecure about showing our true colors how we feel, or maybe we're just not quite sure, but a little bit of a nudge may may uh, ensure that we feel that way, for example, in the group. How, how do we get an early warning of the size of those who are close to being moved from that hidden, what Ronald Reagan might have called silent majority even? How do we gauge the size of that, whether it's vaccine hesitancy or something else, before it surprises us? So there are two things that can be done. Uh, Google knows a lot. So they know a lot about what's inside people's heads because people are searching for things that they are reluctant to talk about. And the other is uh, guaranteed an anonymity. So my little story about the athlete, he believed his anonymity was guaranteed, so he disclosed. And in the experiment in Saudi Arabia, those young men were uh, trusting that their anonymity is guaranteed. If there's someone who know, who it is known will not tell the world, hey, he thinks this, you know, uh, threatening thing, then you can find out some stuff. So it's trying to listen for this in uh, a kind of under a cloak of anonymity, rather than waiting for people to speak out, whether it's climate change or vaccines or what have you, rather than be surprised. What about as individuals? You talked about the threshold there for diverse thresholds, the zeros and ones and twos, three is infinite. How do you test for that? And can you test for that in an individual? It's extremely difficult. And one reason is that individuals, even through introspection, may not know their thresholds. So many people who are participating in or joining, you know, take your political cause, your favorite or least favorite one, they may not have known their thresholds. And this is um, 
for, from the standpoint of predicting social outcomes, very challenging. Let's call it suggestive and impossibility thesis, which is we can't get clarity. But from the standpoint of, you know, the arc of human history, it's also inspiring. It suggests that prediction is really hard. So some fantastic things, you know, uh, take your pick, uh, are possible even at moments when everything seems blocked. We have several questions on Slido and I'm gonna kind of merge them together because they all have to do with a kind of availability cascade. You've coined the term in the past, um, a kind of echo chamber effect that we've seen on all the algorithms that uh, on social media that we participate in. So what if anything can be done to ameliorate that given that you've told us number four, the group polarization makes us more extreme. It does not moderate us. Okay, so let's talk about two things. Uh, there was a time in the United States when people were really scared they were gonna get Ebola, even though at that time, more Americans had married the average movie star than had died of Ebola. I think at least two of us have married the average movie star. And people weren't thinking, oh my gosh, I might marry a movie star or a hooray. The reason they were so scared of Ebola was the availability heuristic. That is the case of a death from Ebola and others uh, elsewhere had were really availability available in the mind, and that can um, uh, drive up risk perception. Now, an availability cascade is some of the things I've discussed interacting with how the mind assesses risk. Now, if people are really scared about something that's a low-level risk. There are a couple things that can be done. One is just to try to point it out as clearly as possible. The other is to do comparative information. You're more likely to marry this movie star than to get that. And that's, uh, that can help. Um, but some availability cascades are actually good things. So in my view, the response to uh, the recent killing of an African-American in the United States by a police officer, that has fueled an availability cascade. That's drawing attention to a long neglected problem. The echo chamber problem is uh, connected, but not the same thing. We in our individual lives can make sure our, our chamber, so to speak, is larger and more diverse than it was yesterday, and more kind of uh, social changey, that's not a very good word, more, more social change oriented. Uh, social media providers like Twitter and Facebook can do much better at trying to combat the presence of echo chambers. Ladies and gentlemen, that's how change happens. The latest from Cass Sunstein, Cass, look, we're really grateful that you made the time. Um, we hope to enlist you in the efforts for uh, preference falsifications for good that people emerge for things for better outcomes. And that in itself may be controversial. Good for whom? So thank you, Cass, very much. Oh, thanks to you. We'll be back in a minute.
Welcome back. And you've heard, if you've been watching, we're now up for many hours, starting out of Asia Pacific with our colleague, Sam Tatum, and then with Dan Bennett and Rory Sutherland out of the UK, and now here in the US. And one of the things that's very important to us is we did partner with the Red Cross uh, to help those who are hurting so badly with COVID. And so the gamification behavioral science version of this is, as you may see now, if you have just awoken, then you should chip in $5. If you're holding your favorite mug about now, think about $2. Hey, and if you've gained got your favorite snazzy shorts on like Sinan does, then that's probably about $6. And you know, if you've got your odd or holy socks on, that's about $5. We really appreciate your help and helping those who need it most. And now let me tell you a little bit about our next remarkable speaker, whom I met many, many years ago, drawn to him by his deep research. He really is an expert, but he's an entrepreneur, he's an investor, a scientist, a professor at MIT, and he got the world's attention yet again with a study that was enormously cited and passed around called The Sp Spread of True and False News Online, where he found that humans can be the useful idiots, not just bots. And we often will pass along stuff even when we know it's false. He has long studied influence in social media and his new book you should check out, The Hype Machine, digs into how social media disrupts our elections, our economy, and even our health. Sinan Aral, welcome and over to you. Thank you guys. Uh, it's an honor to be here, a true pleasure. Uh, what a fantastic lineup. Thank you to all of the organizers for having me and for all of you who are listening. I uh, just wanna give you a very brief overview of, um, of something that I'm quite proud of that I've just finished, uh, which is my very first book uh, called The Hype Machine, which details the last 20 years of my scientific research. I started researching social media before Facebook was founded, uh, and I've been researching it ever since. Um, even then, when I began in early 2000, 2001, I had an idea that this kind of technology could be incredibly disruptive, that it could have tremendous promise and hold the potential for tremendous peril. Uh, and I think that a lot of us are now realizing just how powerful it is, uh, its impacts on our democracy, our elections, uh, our economies, our businesses, uh, and even our health, our mental health, but also other types of health. So I just want to talk to you a little bit about some of the issues that I cover in this book um, and, and really go into detail uh, into the science of what's going on under the hood of social media and what we can do about it. So the first place that everybody starts is obviously democracy. We are six months from possibly the most consequential election in the United States in our lifetime. Uh, and we are approaching that election in the midst of a global pandemic, in the midst of uh, understandable and justifiable uh, social protest uh, around um, uh, police brutality. Uh, and we know that in the last election, there was a tremendous amount of foreign interference in the U.S. election. So in 2016, uh, Russia sent misinformation uh, to disrupt the election to 126 million people on Facebook, 20 million people on Instagram. They sent 10 million tweets at least uh, and provided 43 hours worth of YouTube content uh, in, the, in the month just before the election uh, in 2016. The bad news is that in 2020, uh, the problem is potentially even more severe now than it was in 2016. And that's because we have other countries uh, that are um, beginning to interfere in our election, including China and Iran. Uh, we are going towards the election in the midst of a global pandemic and a tremendous amount of civil unrest. Uh, we had primary elections in Georgia just the other day where there were four hour lines uh, for people to vote. 
Um, and we know that the foreign interference and the attacks are just becoming more sophisticated. So uh, our um, intelligence community has reported that Russia has moved its servers from outside of the United States to inside of the United States because our surveillance capabilities are uh, less uh, capable uh, domestically than they are uh, on foreign soil. Uh, we know that Russia has infiltrated Iran's cyber war department, perhaps to launch attacks that make it seem like they come from Iran rather than from Russia. So things are more sophisticated, more actors, and a lot more confusion uh, during a very consequential election year uh, where a lot of things are hanging in the balance. But it's not just about democracy and elections that social media has an impact. In uh, April uh, 2013, the AP put out this tweet, which said, breaking uh, two explosions in the White House and Barack Obama has been injured. This tweet was retweeted 4,000 times in about five minutes and went viral thereafter. But it wasn't a true tweet. It was a false tweet that was uh, propagated by Syrian hackers that had hacked the AP Twitter handle. Uh, and the problem with this is that we have systems of automated trading algorithms that are designed to, uh, to sense the sentiment in social media and then to make buy-sell recommendations to institutional investors based on that social media sentiment. So this tweet and it going viral it's a pretty big event if the, if the president had been injured in the White House. It triggered uh, trading algorithms to trade on this sentiment and actually sent the stock market crashing, wiping out $140 billion in equity value in a matter of minutes. This is one tweet, one uh, moment in time. But imagine the trillions of tweets that are happening uh, all over the world all the time and the economic impacts on business uh, are, are also quite large. It's not just about democracy. And it's not just about democracy, elections, and business, but it has everything also to do with our health. So as we are experiencing this difficult global pandemic, we know that there's a tremendous amount of misinformation that is affecting health outcomes, that is affecting uh, public health diplomacy, uh, between the countries that should be coordinating with one another, uh, China, Europe, and the United States. Um, and if you think that COVID misinformation is the first time we have public health misinformation, um, you know, memories are very short because just last year, uh, we know that there was a tremendous wave of misinformation that was related perhaps to vaccine hesitancy in the United States, um, we know, for instance, that measles was essentially eradicated or eliminated in the U United States in the year 2000. In 2010, there were 63 cases of measles in the United States. In 2019, in just the first six months of the year, there were 1,250 cases of measles in the United States. And we know that Facebook ads targeting Communities like Clark County in Washington, like Rockland County in New York, uh, were um, uh, bought on Facebook and other uh, social media sites to uh, spread, for instance, anti-vaccine content, a lot of which has been uh, debunked as false. Um, and so it also is related to our public health and to our mental health. Uh, how it affects our um, loneliness, our depression, and so on. And in this book, I go into great detail outlining each of these uh, potential uh, perils of social media. <clears throat> and so all of these perils uh, have are rooted in the wave of social media that has sort of swept the globe in essentially the last decade. Uh, if you think about it, just 10 years ago, uh, we really only had, or maybe 15 years ago, uh, the, the phone, the fax machine, and email to communicate with one another. But in a very short span of time, uh, we have all become uh, very heavy users of social media uh, with these tremendous consequences. 
But social media doesn't just have the potential for peril. There's also a tremendous amount of promise in social media. When uh, the 8.2 magnitude earthquake hit Nepal in 2015, uh, Facebook not only activated its safety check feature that notified millions of people of the safety of their family members in and around the earthquake, but while Europe donated $3 million to the re relief efforts and the United States donated $10 million, Facebook spun up a Donate Now button, which generated $15.5 million of relief effort from 770,000 people in 175 countries which gives you the sense of the scale of the positive things that can be done with this technology as, as well. It's certainly an organizing tool for, um, for uh, civil expression and demonstration. Now we're seeing in the important Black Lives Matter movement, but we've seen in the snow revolution in Russia, uh, we've seen in Tahrir Square um, and in Hong Kong, uh, and I go into detail in the book about both the strengths and the weaknesses of social media used for this kind of organizing. Another great example, a very silly meme, doused yourself with ice water, a bucket of ice water, raised the ice bucket challenge, obviously, raised a quarter of a billion dollars for ALS research in eight weeks. As an economist, we do research on the economic impacts of these types of technologies and through incredibly innovative research, estimating the consumer surplus generated by the free product that Facebook alone provides. Uh, it's been estimated that it generates about, a, uh, about $370 billion of consumer surplus in the United States in a single year uh, for a free product. And you can imagine what that means globally. It creates opportunities to build and run small businesses. It creates social capital. It creates economic opportunity. I certainly lead with the peril that can be caused by social media, but I try to remind us of the tremendous promise that also exists in social media. Um, I will note that we are currently experiencing what I call the COVID 180, which is that before the pandemic hit, social media was a pariah. We had uh, you know, the Netflix documentary, The Great Hack. We had Sasha Baron Cohen at the Anti-Defamation League calling social media the greatest propaganda machine in history. We had the delete Facebook movement. All of these are very valid criticisms of social media, but social media was a pariah before the pandemic. But once we were sheltered in and everyone scurried off the streets and logged on to get online, Facebook, Twitter, and the rest broke records every day. And we realized how essential they were for the information that we were getting, for the human connection that we had to our friends and family, uh, for the um, uh, informativeness, the health information, and so on. What this demonstrates is that right now we are at a crossroads with social media about how we use it, how we design it, how we regulate it. Um, and we're at a crossroads between privacy, free speech, truth, democracy, and true human connection on one hand, and insecurity, hate speech, falsity, authoritarian tendencies and, and political polarization through filter bubbles that Cass Sunstein was talking about uh, just a second ago on the other hand. And the next 18 to 24 months of how we regulate and deal with social media um, is going to be essential to where we end up as a global society. So in order to understand how we can harness the technology for the promise and avoid the peril, I go under the hood of social media and really describe 20 years of not just my own, but the general science on social media, um, beginning with uh, how it evolved from the technology trifecta of the emergence uh, and sweeping of the globe of digital social networks, smartphones, and investments in machine intelligence that run the algorithms uh, of social media. And then I go into exactly how it is that social media hooks us 
first neurologically. So I go into the social science, uh, sorry, the neuroscience of how social media affects our brains. Um, there is a common uh, in cultural anthropology and in um, cognitive anthropology, there is a hypothesis known as the social brain hypothesis, which has gained a ton of evidence over the last 10 years, which basically argues that human beings are as advanced and intelligent as they are, and our brains have evolved, not because of our manual dexterity or our ability to have logical reasoning skills, but because of our sociality, our ability to uh, to compute and understand complex social organization and situations. Now, if you have a belief that any of that is possible, that really our social evolution has determined our brain's evolution, then the uh, invention of social media, which essentially puts us in direct contact with trillions of social signals every day, you can imagine is like tossing a lit match into a pool of gasoline because our brains were built for social media or more appropriately, social media was built for our brains. So I describe how it affects our brains, our mental health and our kids. Uh, but then I, as an economist, I go into the economics of social media and the underlying market structure, the concept of network effects and local network effects and what that means for how we should regulate social media, but also what that means for questions like, why is it that Facebook uh, beat MySpace? And it has everything to do with network effects, local network effects, and, how, and their uh, go-to-market strategy, which really harness this like we've never seen uh, before. And I also go into the technical aspects of the design of the systems, how they lock us in uh, to uh, technical walled gardens and what we can do about it. Now, a lot of people think about social media as sort of imposing peril upon us, uh, but I think that that kind of technological determinism uh, absolves us from our own responsibility in this process, which is to say that essentially um, human beings have a very important role to play in what happens next to our society, whether it's polarization or the impacts on our democracy, or whether it's about um, you know, the public health impacts or the, the economic impacts of this technology. And the reason for that is because the uh, core process that determines the outcomes from social media in our society is what I call the hype loop, which is the dynamic interplay of machine intelligence and human behavior. What happens in social media is that machine learning algorithms uh, ingest everything that we do, who we, who we friend, what we read, what we buy, uh, and it learns our preferences. And then it makes suggestions for who we should friend next, what should we should read next, and through advertising and other types of nudges, what we should buy next or who we should vote for next. And if you think about this from a human evolution perspective, even who we should date next and therefore how humanity may evolve uh, in general. Uh, you may be surprised to hear that relationships born of the algorithms on social dating sites um, surpassed face-to-face -face meeting and or friend introductions for how relationships are formed in 2013. So seven years ago, uh, algorithms overtook face-to-face -face introductions for how we choose our mates in society. But the hype loop, uh, the interplay of machine intelligence and human behavior, uh, includes not just the suggestions and the machine intelligence of making those suggestions, but also how we consume those suggestions and act, what we choose to read, who we choose to friend, what we choose to share, so the design of these systems and our own decision-making has a lot to do with what happens next. I also describe in the book how we can affect change, how we can approach this crossroads of social media that we sit at and ensure the promise and avoid the peril. And that really boils down to four categories of lever that we have, which are 
money, code, norms, and laws. Money being the incentives driving the, the business models of the platforms, code being the design of the algorithms and the platforms themselves, norms being what we accept as socially responsible behavior on social media, how we decide to act on social media, and laws, how we regulate social media. Should Facebook be broken up? Should Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act be repealed or be uh, given to the FCC? For instance, the new Trump executive order. How should speech be regulated online? How should political speech be regulated? How should we deal with misinformation? All of these are addressed one by one uh, in the book. Right now, we are at this crossroads thinking about how we should regulate, for instance, Facebook and other social media. Should they be broken up? Would that solve misinformation or privacy problems? And we have multiple different privacy regimes in the world. We have China, which is essentially using uh, social media to surveil uh, uh, users of social media. And we have very large Chinese social media apps like WeChat, uh, that are in the global marketplace. We have Europe, which takes a completely different viewpoint through the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, that essentially protects privacy very strictly. And then we have the United States in the middle trying to do what it, it trying to decide what it's going to do next on privacy. Currently, we have a patchwork of state by state privacy legislation led by California. Um, but we are likely to implement federal legislation in the coming uh, years. And considering how to do that well is incredibly important. Uh, we've written at length, for instance, in Science, Science Magazine here, an article about how we protect our elections from social media manipulation. Uh, and I cover that also in great detail in the book. The main point of the book, the main message, if there's just one to distill from the book, is that we can achieve the promise of the wisdom of our collective intelligence through this technology uh, that we have de developed uh, in social media while avoiding the peril for our democracies, for our economies, and for our public health. Um, but in order to do that, we have to take a rigorous scientific look under the hood of how all of this works with regard to the economics, the technical design, the sociology of social media. Uh, and by doing that, I try to answer the question, how must we, how can we, and how must we adapt to this technology to achieve the promise uh, while avoiding the peril? Um, the Hype Machine is available for pre-order now. I really look forward to uh, a, a discussion both now at Nudgestock, but into the future with many of you who I hope to see in person soon. Thank you. Um, thanks so much. Terrific. Now, a quick question on that. When you look at remedies or guides like money, code, norms, and laws, how on earth can we get buy-in to any change? Because it seems that fact checking doesn't work because if the fact checking says what I choose to believe is false, I now blame the fact checkers. If you even have uh, artificial intelligence with GAN networks creating humans that don't exist, but they resonate with me, I get pissed off when you tell me that they're not real. So how do you regulate this when those who will feel regulated against will always protest and never buy in? So Chris, great question. I think as with any of these questions, the devil is in the details and in the science. So recent scientific research is in fact showing just the opposite. Accuracy nudges get people to believe false news less, get people to share false news less. And when people label false news themselves, they get into a mentality of thinking critically about the information that they are consuming. Uh, and therefore, there are promising leads in the science about how we can deal with it. When I gave my TED talk in 2000, uh, TEDx CERN talk in 2018 about false news, about that article that you described at the beginning of this session, I suggested labeling as an important possible way of dealing with the false news crisis. 
What we're seeing now is we're seeing divergent policies at the platforms on this. We're seeing Twitter label things more. We're seeing Facebook not label things. And we're seeing the scientific results indicate that labeling can have a meaningful effect on depressing the spread of false news and getting people to believe and share it less to begin with, addressing both sides of the hype loop. And even the labeling creates some polarization because we seem not to have, at least in the U.S. anymore, any independent adjudicators who are trusted by all, even if they come at a conclusion that you don't like. Last question here. Uh, some on Slido have asked about, you know, who are the most impactful messengers of fake news? And I might twist that around the opposite way. And you think about your work and Duncan Watts. Is it more that who are the most gullible and susceptible? Because there is a certain bullshit receptivity, as it's been called in behavioral science as a technical term. Do you think it's about effective messengers or more about that dry tinder ready to burn? It's funny, we've done research on influence and susceptibility in networks, as you know, and the answer is it's both. It is both working in concert that, uh, that develops this problem. We have seen, for instance, that in terms of the susceptibility side, uh, people who, are, who uh, score high on uh, critical thinking are less likely to be susceptible. So I think that there are some important avenues, for instance, for digital literacy, teaching our kids to be critical consumers of information is important and influence is also very important. And uh, in the book, I describe many different factors that create influence in social media. Sinan, we thank you and definitely we're gonna grab the book, tear into it and come back at you with even harder questions. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. And now I want to tell you all just a couple of things before I introduce our next speaker. We have still coming an amazing lineup going all afternoon, which includes people like Laurie Santos, who has the largest student following on earth, some 2 million, and about a quarter of her Yale University uh, students as well. She, of course, is on the science of well-being, and her podcast is The Happiness Lab. But we also have many others. We're going to have a discussion on where is the diversity in behavioral science? Are we too weird? W-E-I-R-D. Um, we'll hear from Eric Johnson, Elke Weber, Kai D. Wright, and two married evolutionary psychologists. There's a sitcom in the making. But before we get to that, let me first tell you about our partners. And this is very important. We've got a couple of them. We've got the B2B Institute, and they're part of LinkedIn, as well as 42 Courses, which is an educational online company. Now, the B2B Institute's a think tank funded by LinkedIn, and it researches the future of B2B marketing, which is a large but still ill-defined category. And when we look at 42 Courses, it's a new creative learning platform offering on-demand courses to help you thrive in the modern world. They're offering a discount for Nudge, Scotch, Nudge, Nudge Stock viewers today. Uh, I'd like to now introduce our next speaker, uh, Tara Austin. Uh, you know, there is a, a neuroscientist saying, which is neurons that fire together wire together. When we do things as humans over and over again, we tend to create deep, deep grooves in our brain metaphorically. And that creates the kind of automatic behavior. Well, Tara Austin is a creative strategist who strives to overcome those deep grooves in our brain, hoping for much groovier outcomes. Here's Tara. Hello, clever people. In the next eight minutes, I'm hopefully gonna remind us why Nudgestock is not only the world's finest festival of behavioral science, but also of creativity. In 1969, Dr. Edward de Bono wrote The Mechanism of Mind, and in it, I believe he anticipated much of what we understand from modern neuroscience to be the underlying mechanisms of creative thinking, mechanisms that if we master, we can become more brilliant thinkers ourselves. And I'd like to share with you some of the techniques I use in my, in my daily work, for which I credit him, and I'd love it if you could help me credit him a little bit more too. 
In the mechanism of mind, de Bono says the mind is not a, like a piece of paper that records information. It is an active information processing system. It self-organizes around the information it receives over time. And this means that patterns form. There are channels of thought that are strengthened in the mind. Um, channels that become quite hard to get outside of. Now, of course, we know today that neurons that fire together, wire together, and indeed, um, if, a if a neural circuit is repeatedly used, that this will strengthen uh, a, a neural pathway and ultimately bias our thinking. Um, so de Bono really anticipated much of this in terms of thinking in, within one channel of thought and how the mind operates, but he also defined something called lateral thinking, moving sideways outside of our channel of thought in order to create a new connection and, uh, and bring a new thought to the surface. So instead of running from A to B, our conditioned patterned way of thought, lateral thinking provides C. And this gives us new connections to ignore the dominant idea and solve the problem in a new way. But cutting across the patterns of our thought is not natural behavior for the brain. As the illustrious Daniel Kahneman says, thinking is to humans as swimming is to cats. They can do it, but they prefer not to. Apart from psychedelics, and see me after class for further discussion about this, but psychedelics uh, stimulate the serotonin 2A receptors in the mind that mimic, if you like, a, a highly dangerous situation in which the brain's response is to laterally connect the mind to become extremely creative in order to um, save its own life. Apart from psychedelics and or a near-death experience, Lateral thinking techniques are some of the best that we have for forced creativity to order. So why don't we give it a try? In what might be the world's biggest ever lateral thinking workshop, if you take part. I'd love you to solve this problem and tweet the answer to hashtag NudgeStock2020 at the end of um, this session. I want you to come up with some solutions for how to get people to wear face masks in public places like shops when this is not yet mandated. Um, how do we nudge uh, their behavior and I'm going to give you a random word so take a look at the screen and take the word that corresponds with the date of your birth and then from there connect connect to the problem now the the, the process here is not logical and vertical um, the surrealist Andre Breton said that the man who cannot imagine a horse galloping on a tomato is an idiot your mind is the most complex object in the known universe. All I'm asking you to do is connect the problem of getting people to wear face masks with the word in hand. And it might seem wrong and weird, but what doesn't, it doesn't matter how you get there. It doesn't matter the path that you follow. It, what matters is creating a new answer. So I might have uh, the word satellite. My birthday's on the 9th. That might make me think of solar panels and sustainability and uh, maybe we, we create up a, create a, a, a cleaning station that disinfects masks um, at the front of stores so that people take them out in order to have them nicely UV disinfected or something and then, and then wear them. Um, what could encourage that behaviour? What matters, as I say, is not how you got there. You might think satellites, you might think Lou Reed, you satellite of love and that might take you somewhere entirely different what matters is you've come up with a whole new idea and i use these techniques in my work as i say um the word hieroglyphic once gave rise to a whole campaign using emojis to talk about sexually transmitted diseases which were quite difficult for people to uh, discuss um, in one workshop I ran for the National Citizen Service, uh, we were looking at how to get young people to actually show up on the day of the programme and not drop out. And the CEO was given the word IKEA and he said, well, that made me think of building blocks. So maybe we give all the, the, um, the kids who come to the programme, we send them something ahead of time that they have to bring on the day, a little piece of something. And if they don't come, then the whole thing will not be complete. They won't have assembled it. The behavioural scientists in the audience might call that a commitment device. And here's the thing, I use behavioural science thinking, which is often sometimes unintuitive, I use it as a lateral thinking tool uh, through what de Bono calls provocations. So I've designed my own little cards based on the mind space framework. But the important thing is for each um, behavioral principle at work here, I've got a little provocation that's designed to make me think differently about the problem in hand. So I might say face masks, uh, the principle is it's incentives and, and present bias. How do we, um, how might we get people to be rewarded in the here and now um, rather than in the future for wearing this mask? 
And I might say, okay, well, when they walk in, there's going to be a great big green flashing sign. It's going to recognize they're wearing a mask. A big thumbs up. Thank you very much for wearing a mask in our store. The principle might be variable rewards. The provocation might say, how might we end build in some kind of lottery system that encourages compliance um, and there's a prize draw every day some random punter in our shop is going to be um, given a, a special prize again what matters is not the principle it's not the provocation it's the generation of a whole new idea that you wouldn't otherwise have had but that's not my point at all because my point really is this the Nobel Prize cannot be awarded posthumously and I know many in our community will feel very deeply that this is uh, a very sad thing, particularly when Amos Tversky was never uh, awarded and honoured for the work that he did alongside Daniel Kahneman, which was his due. Let us not let uh, Dr De Bono, who turned 87 last month, let us not let him, who has anticipated so much of what we understand about creative thinking, who has trained millions of people worldwide through his 87 books in 45 different languages, thousands of workshops with thousands of participants. Let us not let him pass from this world without being um, honoured in the way that he should be. Uh, at a time when arguably the world needs creative and lateral thinking more than ever before. So Twitterati, I ask that this Nudge Stock 2020 um, that you help me ask the Nobel jury to pay attention um, to the value that Dr. De Bono has given this world. Um, share with me your lateral solutions and a simple tweet, hashtag De Bono for Nobel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tara Austin. Now, if you've been watching for a while, you know that there are several ways you can interact with us and get more and more information. So one of the ways is, of course, you can hashtag NudgeStock2020 on any of the social media platforms and see what conversation is going on there. We also have an Obehave blog and podcast, as well as Conversations That Matter webinar and NudgeStock news. You'll be able to find lots. If you missed anything, you can come back. And how do you do that? you go to nudgestock.co.uk and you will find more information there to make sure that you stay in touch with everything that's been recorded and the ongoing conversations. Our next guest, if you've been in behavioral science for any time, you will no doubt have encountered one of his seminal studies. You may remember that there was something that really struck everybody as puzzling. And that was a study that looked at organ donation in terms of, you know, maybe country next to country or state next to state. How could you have such a high proportion of people next door to others who do the opposite behavior? A high proportion on the one hand who agree to donate their organs in the event they say die in an auto crash and next door, you know, very, very few. Well, the person that cracked that is our next speaker, Eric J. Johnson. He's the guy that revealed all of this, and he revealed that it wasn't about their views so much as it was about what he and others call choice architecture. And that was a near and dear finding to him because he himself was seeking an organ replacement. And over the decades, he's been re-examining human decision-making. In fact, he runs the Decision Sciences Center at Columbia University, where he's a professor. And I have to tell you, he's also a damn fine bass player. So with that, over to you, Professor Johnson. Thanks so much, Chris. And I want to say hello to everybody from Toronto to Tokyo, from Shanghai to San Francisco, and from Cape Town to Berlin. It's a great honor and unusual circumstance to be able to talk to so many people from my office in Poquag, New York. Uh, it's just great and uh, I'm very excited to be here and to be invited. Um, I'm gonna take a moment to talk a little bit to get, get us all on the same ground to just say three things. The first thing is that nudges can be described by numbers and I'll talk about three numbers today. But before I go ahead, the other thing I wanna do is make sure we all agree on what we mean by a nudge. It's, it's used lots of different ways to talk about lots of different interventions. And I'm going to be pretty old school here and talk about what's actually in the nudge book, which is to say we're not changing incentives and we're not changing information. 
So for example, if you're selling insurance, we're not going to hide things from you and we're not going to change the prices. But we could change what Richard Thaler calls in misbehaving seemingly irrelevant factors. So we could reframe them or we could make some more salient than others. That's sort of the key to what I'm going to call often choice architecture to try and specify those kinds of changes as opposed to just simply nudges which have a broad range of things. Okay, first my three numbers, $456 per family. This is what choice architecture could save people if it's provided on the Obamacare health exchanges. Let me step back and say, health insurance is a really tough decision for people. It has lots of uncertainty. You don't know how much you're going to use. It has lots of unfamiliar terms. These are things like what a deductible is, what a copay is, what, what max payout is. In fact, if you take a look at one of the first um, exchanges run by the state of Massachusetts, it looked like this. And given the complexity of technology, I didn't animate this, but if I press a button to animate this and have it scroll, it takes two to three minutes. That's a lot of information for people to try and make the right decision. So when Obamacare was on the cusp, we were lucky enough to do some studies with people who were potential Obamacare buyers. Just for those of you who may not be familiar, these are people in the bottom third of the socioeconomic distribution in the US as the target market. And so we wanted to ask them, could they pick the right insurance policy. And think about this almost like a fight, a flight simulator. You know, in a flight simulator, you said, okay, here, here's the uh, Bo Boeing 737, go ahead and land it in Heathrow. And if you can do that, that's fine. If you can't do that, well, that's a crash. We gave people essentially a very simple version of the insurance decision, told them they were going to go to the doctor a certain number of times and see if they could find the cheapest policy. Now, what you see on the screen now is just one version of what we did we got it down to be so simple. It was just literally four alternatives. We named them very uh, cleverly A, B, C, and D here, and three prices, the monthly pr uh, premium, the copay, and an annual deductible. And we wanted to see, could people do this task? Because after all, when people built choice into the health exchanges, they thought people would pick the right policy for them. Well, if this had been a, a flight uh, simulator, it would have crashed. This is a little bit of a complex graph, but let me walk you through it. The red bar is how big a mistake they made. These people made on average over $500 errors in picking the right policy. That's $500 that could go to many other things like food, entertainment, cell phone. It's $500 that is essentially wasted. Same product being paid $500 too much for. The blue bar is fairly simple. It's essentially how well they did on this test, what percentage got the right policy, and here it was less than 50%, about 40% actually got the, the, the right policy. So we were pretty depressed and we started asking, could anyone ever make this choice? And thinking about it, I realized that under my very, very nose were exactly the people who should be able to do it. These were Columbia Masters of Business Administration. After all, many of them had worked in consulting, they uh, worked in financial services, they should be able to do it. And so we gave them the task and lo and behold, they could. Their mistakes went down from over $500 to less than $100. And about 71% of them got the right policy. So we asked them, gee, how did you do it? And they said, well, Excel, duh. They basically had copy and pasted our webpage, put it in Excel and did the calculation. So this was a big clue to what people, ordinary people weren't being able to do. So I have a lot of economists friends, immediately they would say the following. Well, that's nice, people screw up, but if you paid them enough money, they would actually get this right. So we went out and paid them enough money that they worked a third harder in, in this. And in fact, this is what happened. Sorry, economists, it didn't make a difference. It basically showed no difference in how, getting it right or how big of an error they made. Now, remember, it's not information and it's not incentives. Well, maybe it's these seemingly irrelevant factors. So we took a lesson from our MBA students and said, how about if we actually just do the math of them? We, by the way, knew that our folks could do the math, they just were deciding not to. Big question, we cut the errors in half by simply doing the calculation, and they were now getting it right about two thirds of the time. We also did the old classic, what I thank you for uh, saying nice things about this, Chris, which is we changed the default. And in fact, that actually had a big effect too, almost the same size as the calculator. But what's interesting is when you combine the calculator with the default, you get an amazing thing happening. 
essentially the errors are smaller than the Columbia MBAs and the percentage correct, they're doing at least as well. We basically, with the right choice architecture, turned ordinary people from the bottom third of the socioeconomic status in the US into people who could choose insurance as well as Columbia MBAs. So to come back to our $460, you could calculate how much each of these interventions uh, improved decision-making. Incentives, only $30. The calculator and the defaults, about $300 each. But together, we saved each family, or if they were subsidized, the taxpayer, $456. If you actually multiply that by the number of people who made insurance decisions um, in the first year of Obamacare, you end up with a number that's about $9 billion. So number one, I think choice architecture has a huge effect on both economic and because this is health and we know that health insurance helps social welfare. So that's the first thing. Second number, 27.2. That is going to be the average effect of a default across domains. Let me step back a second and explain a little bit about that. As Chris so kindly mentioned, we had done some work in the early 2000s looking at differences in organization agreement across countries. And this is the kind of famous graph that on the right that I, Chris talked about. Now, that's a nice poster child, but how typical is this? How much of a difference do, do behavioral interventions make um, in the real world? There's a nice paper done by uh, De La Vina and Linos, where they actually look at all the interventions done by behavioral insights team and the American equivalent uh, across a number of domains and analyze what was the average uptake? What was the average impact? You see big dramatic effects in my graph. Well, it turns out in the behavioral insights, the average intervention increased take up by 1.4% much more modest. In fact, if they looked at, they looked also at academic papers, all the ones that people like myself have published, they found the average uh, impact was 8.7%. There are two explanations for this. The first one, which I prefer, is that we're just better nudgers than the, not, than the professional nudgers. It turns out they looked at that. The real answer is that basically academics seem to cherry pick. They publish the papers where the effects are large, um, for good reason, we, we like to impress people with, with the points we're trying to make, but it, the real number is probably closer to the 1.4% in those studies. So chastised by this, we actually took a look at all the default effects that were ever published and studies that were not published. This is with uh, John Yakimovitz, who's at Harvard now, Shannon Duncan, who's at Wharton, and somebody you'll hear about in a few minutes, Elke Weber. And we basically looked at all the papers and tried to see is there, a is there a big effect of defaults? On average, there was, it's 27.4%. And so basically it looks like defaults have a big effect. If I default option A or default option B, that's gonna drive 27% of the choices for one or the other. That's a significant effect. But what's really interesting and worrisome is the effect varied. When you looked across all 58 studies, only 78% had significant default effects. That's four out of five. 17% had no effect, not statistically significant. And two of the studies, about 3%, backfired. This is really an interesting question and something that we talk about a little bit in the paper, but also I, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, in a forthcoming book. I'll plug that more thoroughly later. But Elka Weber will talk a little bit about this in a second um, when she talks in the 11th hour about part of this, which is query theory and how we assemble preferences. Okay, so I've convinced you, I think that defaults can have, and choice architecture can have large effects. I think I've also convinced you that those effects really depend upon the context. The final thing I wanna talk about is something very new and very exciting, and that's a question which is who gets nudged? That is, are there people who are more susceptible for choice architecture interventions or nudges than others? And this is actually interesting. The answer is roughly, in some studies, 1.4 times more likely if you are lower socioeconomic status. To explain that, let me tell you a little story. We were lucky enough to come to data that was a long survey over three hours with 17,000 Americans about their consumer finances. We looked at this data to find people who were working, had retirement plans, and had been offered a default in their retirement plans by the employer. 
And we simply asked, did you take the default or not? So interestingly enough, we found something quite nice. People who were in the bottom 25th percentile of socioeconomic status took the default 59% of the time. Those who were higher in SES took the default much less 41% of the time. There's almost a 50% difference in default taking for the people who are poorer and the people who are richer. And just to give you a flavor of this, let me tell you a little bit about people in each of those categories. Uh, the 25th percentile people had started college but never finished. They didn't even have an associate's degree. They made about $39,000 a year for family income. People in the top 25% the, at the 20, top 25th percentile had some postgraduate work. They actually had finished college and gone on at least to start degrees beyond that. And they had an average income for the family of $126. So 126, excuse me, $1,000, important, important three zeros there. The thing that's important here is that notice that the default has a bigger effect on poorer people. And that's something I want to come back to, but that's just a story. Let me tell a little bit about some other studies we've done showing the same thing. Okay. One of the things we've done now is done a set of experiments where we try different kinds of nudges in different kinds of uh, tasks. So we use lots of tasks, for example, financial decision-making, consumer decision-making. And we even looked at COVID protection. What would you do in this situation? Changing, for example, whether one choice was defaulted, whether we sorted the options from right to wrong, or whether we simplified the choice set, gave you 10 choices or three. So we're doing this across a broad range of domains and a broad range of tasks. Let me just show you an example of one item, a couple items. You plan to go out to public to get groceries and are considering what to wear. You want to be safe while following the recommendations from the CDC and other experts. Do you, and people had three choices here, wear an N95 respirator, wear a homemade cloth face mask, or not wear a mask? And obviously the right answer is the second one, which is italicized here, wear a homemade cloth mask. So what we did was essentially either get, make that the default or not, and see if that made a difference in people's choices of protection. In financial decisions, we did very similar things. Imagine you have debt on two credit cards on the same bank, have money that you would like to use to pay off the debt. Both cards have balances of more than $500. One card has interest rate that is twice as high as the other. We try to make these not simple math problems, but logic problems at best. And you could either pay off the $500 on the higher interest card, pay off 250 on both, or pay off $500 on the lower interest card. Again, we could change what the default was. The picture which emerges after all these studies is quite simple. It is that again, people who are lower in socioeconomic status are more likely to be affected by nudges. This graph's a little bit complicated, but just look on the, this axis on, on the bottom axis, right is on the rich, poor is on, is on the left. All right, right, the right are rich, poor are left. And what you see are three lines. The top line is pretty simple. That's people who've had the good default. The bottom two lines are the neutral default and the bad default. What you see is, okay, for the very rich people, defaults don't make a difference. But for the poor, they make a very big difference. In fact, you make people pretty well off in their decisions if you give them the good default, but they do badly if you give them no default or the bad default. Now, this is kind of important, and we asked, what causes this? One thing is we looked for fluid intelligence, so we gave people tests that are standardized measures of, of how fast you think, no effect on default taking. We looked at lack of effort. That is, did people actually work hard? We, this is on the web, so we actually measure how long they look at the item. That does not affect whether or not they take the default. We looked at personality, conscientiousness, agreeableness, a scale called need for cognition. All those things had no effect on default taking. We even used incentives. We paid people to get the right answer. That did not have an effect on whether or not they paid attention to the default. The answer is not surprisingly are two er things that we know a lot about. One is numeracy, and that essentially is how well and comfortably are we thinking about numbers. And the other is domain knowledge. So for financial decisions, this would be financial literacy. For health, it's health literacy. Now, this seems sort of obvious, but the default point is really important. It takes a lot of work to get people to be more numerate or to teach them the domain knowledge. 
Changing default is easy. Literally, if you look at the HTML code, it's changing one line of code. And we can get people to do much better by changing the default than we can by trying to by trying to teach them, or at least as well as trying to teach them. This is important because it has, and I'm going to close in a couple of seconds, the kind of really nice result, which is this. That basically, I'm sorry, let me go back one more, which is this that nudges can reduce disparities. That actually people who are disadvantaged because of background, because of lack of numeracy or lack of domain knowledge can be helped significantly by using the right choice architecture. And remember, it's not just about defaults. We've done this with sorting. We've done this as well with the number of options. So actually a very inexpensive way of doing interventions to improve decision-making that is particularly effective is to change the choice architecture. Okay, let me summarize by sort of make, reviewing the three numbers I talked about. First is I wanna talk about two metrics we've talked about. One is dollar value. When you change choice architecture, you can save people in health insurance a lot of money, significant amounts of money. And that I would argue that ignoring choice architecture is actually not just a mistake, but one that is a costly mistake. We also then talked about a second metric, which is effect sizes, and showed that effect sizes vary across different kinds of choice architecture interventions or different kinds of nudges. And that moreover, they are very variable across studies. And that we need a, a theory, I think, for how choice architecture and nudging works. And so the, here's my unabashed plug. Uh, a book, Design Decisions, will be coming out next uh, uh, fall of 2021. Riverhead Books, it's where I developed that. Again, Elko Weber will talk a little bit about at least one part of, of that theory. Okay, one factor that accounts for this variability is people different susceptibility. Low SES people show larger effects of choice architecture. This is actually important. It has good news. Nudges can diminish disparities, but there's really very serious bad news here. People in previous talks have used the term sludge for bad choice of architecture, bad nudges. Well, sludge hurts the poor more. If you recall that graph, basically, it actually hurt them more than providing no uh, default at all. So that, I think, is a very important takeaway. The field is now 12 years old since Nudge the Book came out, and I think it's doing very well. It's a tweener, but it's doing pretty well and actually has a lot of potential. Uh, I'll close by thanking all the funders, what the National Science Foundation, Russell Sage, and Alfred P. Slow Foundation. And I won't name all my marvelous co-authors um, on the work, but I will point out this is Kellen. It's not his precocious daughter. So closing on that, I will turn it back to, to Chris. Thank you very much. Eric, thank you. Uh, listen, this is a little eye-opening because I think that most people look at nudges as either beneficial or benign or benignly ineffective, meaning there's no negative. So the idea that on the one hand, nudges can discriminate unintentionally and, and, and have a differential in terms of uh, uh, class or knowledge, domain knowledge or income and demographics. And on the other, that they're not just neutral, that if we're not careful, we could convert a nudge for the underprivileged into sludge, if we've got that right. Could you give us an example that you might see out there either existing or one you worry about to make this idea concrete for us? So uh, uh, one of my favorite um, bad nudges is when I try and unspam myself. If I'm getting a spam, they're required by law to have an unsubscribe. I'm seeing lots of links today where the unsubscribe link is there. It's just in light gray and a dark gray background in very tiny eight point font. Okay, that's meant, I have an opinion. I wanna get rid of this spam and they make it very hard for me to exercise that. Now, if you think about consumer finance, I think the more complex the contract, the harder it is for people to understand. That in fact suggests to me a very important um, implication, which is that the poor actually are end, ending up having less good decisions in that choice architecture could help, but is being potentially exploited by some kinds of firms. When you look at those in the lower social economic status, 
one of the questions coming across from Slido is it could it be that people with lower SES usually have scarcity of time and resources in the rest of their life and hence makes decision making that much more difficult? The answer is yes, those things would make this the situation worse outside of our experiments. But one of the nice things about doing experiments is you can control that. And actually we pay people. So they're actually by taking the wrong default, losing money. So it's actually costing them. Um, the nice thing about experiment, the bad thing about experiments is they're outside of many of these real world effects. The good thing about experiments is they're outside of many of these world effects. So I think we can tease those apart. And you mentioned that you looked at many of the cognitive styles and personality big five, and basically that did not explain the difference in these. Somebody on Slido asked uh, beyond need for cognition, they asked need for cognitive closure. That is for those uh, who are not familiar with the jargon, some people need um, more certainty in their lives and, than others. And they're more uncomfortable with uncertainty. They have uncertainty avoidance. So this question was, is there anything that that might mediate? Maybe, we haven't gotten around to trying that yet. And the nice thing is all this, all of our paradigm, our data is all on open science frameworks. So you can actually do the experiments and manipulate anything you, and measure anything you want to see if you can influence that. We will continue to explore these issues. Um, we're very interested, for example, on people's time preferences. The people who are impatient, are, more, are they more likely to use uh, choice search shortcuts? Don't have the goods yet, but there's lots of work to be done. Eric Johnson of Columbia University, thank you so much. We look forward to your book. Thanks so much for making the time for Nudge Stock. Thanks, now, everyone, it was a real pleasure. Pleasure is ours. Now everyone, uh, we're doing very well on the Red Cross donations. Um, Anna Karens, who's behind the scenes and running everything here on Nudge Stock, deserves a huge shout out, messages me updates on this. And we're really getting up around 10,000 US dollars. I'll make the quick conversion from pound sterling in my head and we continue to rise. So here again is the cartoon challenge. If you uh, find that you're thinking about food right now, after all, it is midday on the East Coast in the United States and just afternoon and central time. If you're thinking about food, why don't you think about a $9 donation to the Red Cross? If you're still in your pajamas, we're gonna hit you with an $11 tag. And if you're doing a little unconventional snacking, how about $7? We're just using this as a way to differentiate and have a little bit of fun with donations, but the Nudge Stock audience has been very generous. We appreciate this. All this, of course, is going to the Red Cross for those most in need in the wake of COVID. Now, as we go forward here, I want to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Elke Weber is a professor of energy and the environment and a professor of psychology and public affairs at Princeton University. And that is quite a combination. And it makes sense because she's an expert on how humans perceive risk, how they make decisions about really crucial areas such as climate change action. And for decades, she's examined human decision-making at the emotional and at the neuroscience levels. Among her discoveries, are that you can change decisions sometimes by changing the order of the words and the choices you offer people. And with that, I'd like to hand over now to Professor Elke Weber.
Welcome everyone, pleasure to be here. I'm gonna talk about why defaults rock and labels matter, query theory and choice architecture. So look at this image. Attention really is our scarcest resource. You can see either the candlestick or the two children looking at each other. You can switch back and forth, but you can't see them both at the same time because our attention is finite. Well, it turns out the same thing holds when we make decisions. Uh, we formalized this uh, in query theory with Eric Johnson and myself. Yes, the guy that you just heard from previously. Query theory holds that we make a decision by generating arguments for option A and for option B. By asking our previous body of experience, what's good about option A? What's good about option B? And we issue those two queries sequentially. Again, because we have finite attention, we can only do one thing at a time. Very importantly, order matters, the order in which we issue those queries. As you query your memory about what's good about option A, you temporarily inhibit arguments for all other options because they're response competitors. And so subsequently, they're not recalled as well. So the million dollar question in query theory really is which choice options are considered first? And one important answer to that question are default options. So let's make an intertemporal decision here. You can either have the option on the left, and in the delay condition, we assign this to be the, the default. You get this amount right away, but if you want to, you can change to get more later. In contrast, in the acceleration condition, the, the later option is the default option. The future option is the default, and you can switch to the earlier one if you want to. Does it make a difference in choice? Yes, we know it makes a difference. George Lonstein showed this back in 1988. But now we repeated the experiment with those two conditions to see whether or not query theory, actually query theory processes lie at the base of this difference in impatience. Uh, and so we do this by giving people the choice and before they make the decision, we ask them to type out loud because it's an online study, what goes on in their mind as, as they think about the, the, the choice that they make the decision. And subsequently we can code those arguments that they gave in this case explicitly. Normally we think this happens implicitly and automatically, but we can code those arguments about whether or not they're randomly interspersed or do they in fact cluster like query theory predicts. And then we can count how many arguments are there for the first option that gets considered or the second option that gets considered. And so just if you look at the slides on the left hand side, we replicate the result that people in the delay condition are more impatient. Lower bars means that you're more impatient. A dollar in a year's time is worth less for you today. Uh, and then the question is, do query theories predict this? On the right, you see that indeed, uh, in under the delay condition, when people are more impatient, they generate more arguments for the impatient option, for the immediate option, which is a default. Uh, and in fact, our clustering algorithm shows you that uh, now conditions, the now choice is considered first uh, in the delay condition uh, and second in the acceleration condition. In other words, the default is considered first. And so the question is, if choice, if the order in which we order those queries, issue these queries makes a difference, maybe we can manipulate the order. So we can tell people in the delay condition to explicitly now first ar generate arguments for immediate consumption in the way they normally do in the natural order that we saw in the previous study, or we reverse the order in the unnatural order. And that should make a difference. The difference between delay and acceleration that we see in the natural order uh, should become smaller or perhaps even reverse in the unnatural order. And when you do that, uh, the results uh, basically show that under in the natural order condition, we replicate the previous results. People are more impatient when immediate consumption is a default option, but that difference becomes non-significant uh, and, the, and the unnatural order uh, generation. So the question is, can we put query theory uh, and the fact that uh, changing the, the default option might make a difference to work to help us reduce the status quo bias that we saw in so many situations, including in environmental decisions and, and, and mitigation of climate change, for example. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence you know, reviewed by Sunstein and Reich in, in a couple of places that it makes a huge difference when green electricity generation is the default offered by utility companies, people are much more likely to go for it than when brown electricity power provision is a default. And one question we asked ourselves in our lab is can, can we put uh, changes in the default to the larger later benefit option also to work with professional decision makers? Uh, in this case, we looked at uh, infrastructure engineers and architects, uh, and we know that they oftentimes make their decisions about uh, how sustainable to be in their design 
with respect to rating systems. You might be familiar with LEADS. We worked with Envision, which applies to a broader range of infrastructure designs. And the current rating system, the software that asks people a, a long number of questions about the design, basically uses industry standards, uh, industry current practice as the implicit uh, default. And you can earn points by doing better than that. We changed the, the software. Uh, and we gave people the conserving option uh, as, a, as the, uh, the, the default option. Uh, and then they would lose points if they wanted to be less ambitious. And we find that even with professional decision makers, engineered and doubt with the conserving level actually scored 24% higher on sustainability. So in other words, defaults make a huge difference. Now, what other answers are there to the million dollar question? What choice options are considered first? And one obviously also has to do with reading order. Uh, left to right for English speakers, and we know from political science that when you vary the position of candidates on, on the voting ballot, uh, top being considered first, to, top to bottom, it makes a significant uh, difference in who gets elected in, in, in many important elections, and we've seen those results. So let me sort of talk about yet a third answer to this important question, which options are considered first, and that has to do with how surface attractive the options are. Uh, of course, that's why we have advertising to put shiny labels, you know, shiny images, beautiful, attractive uh, images next to the option that we want people to buy. Uh, but it might also work in different ways. And this gets us to the attractive label part, part of my title. Uh, here we gave people uh, a representative sample of Americans, a choice between two airline tickets, uh, one just the, the ticket itself and one a ticket that included a carbon user fee. There were two pages of text that explained why it was priced the way it was and what the money was, would, would, would do. The only difference between respondents was whether the user fee was called a carbon tax or a carbon offset. Uh, and would that make a difference in the uptake? And just as before, people, before they made the decision, typed out loud what went through their mind as they made this decision, then decided. And uh, as you can see, when the uh, user fee is being called a carbon offset, it makes no difference uh, to our respondents who they are, Democrats, independents, and Republicans, on average, choose the inclusive option 62% of the time. But for the other half, for whom we use the name, uh, carbon tax uh, for the user fee. Uh, it doesn't make a difference for the Democrats, but for Republicans, the uptake goes down to 27%. And so the question is, can we explain uh, these uh, differences in, in, in choice uptake by query three processes? And I just want to show you a couple of lists of what people type uh, in before they make this decision. Here's one, here's another one. And again, we can basically code these arguments for does it support uh, the inclusive option or the other option and then we can count the number of arguments for the inclusive option uh, for the forward-looking option and we can also see whether or not these arguments are randomly interspersed for one or the other option or whether they do cluster and does the does the clustering lead to a larger number of arguments for the first queried option uh, and in in in, in fact you know, and do these two uh, process measures and predict choice and so the answer is yes there is clustering, they're not randomly interspersed, and the clustering looks very much like the choice pattern, as does the number of arguments for the inclusive option. And yes, indeed, uh, you combine those two predictors and they predict the choice patterns in, in, in a mediation analysis. So again, it's a recipe for intervention. Make cha change uh, the attractiveness of the option that you want to have adopted. Uh, let me give you one more answer to the question, yet one more, uh, which choice options are considered first. Uh, and the answer to that question is options that fit our active goal or our current mood. And so here we have a study that I conducted with Jen Lerner, uh, where we looked at the, the question about whether people's mood, uh, being in a sad mood, for example, might change how they make an intertemporal decision. Now, Jen, uh, Jen had done research on sadness actually leading to greater consumption, at least in Western countries. When we feel sad, we have to fill the void. And we do that by going shopping. And if you want to go shopping, you need money now. So the question was, would uh, sad as opposed to other mood states change your interpretable choice, the, the type of uh, decisions that we saw at, at the beginning of my talk? Uh, and so the answer to that is yes. Remember, lower bars means that people are more impatient. And so people who were exposed uh, before their intertemporal choice with a sad study, uh, with a sad uh, story, uh, as opposed to a disgusting story, in fact, this were movie clips, 
uh, or with a neutral movie clip. So people who were in fact in a sad state were much more impatient in their decisions. They were much likely to pick the immediate uh, option, money option. And again, query theory processes uh, supported that. They were much more likely to have impatient thoughts and the, the larger number of impatient thoughts as predicted by query theory uh, was caused by the immediate consumption option being queried in a, in a cluster and the cluster coming first. So uh, let's summarize this. Uh, basically this whirlwind tour of query theory showed you that query theory mechanisms underlie many of your favorite interventions in choice architecture. Uh, the, the, the process of uh, Query theory being focused on one option first uh, explains uh, how many of the prospect theory framing interventions work, including default effects and the endowment effect. Uh, they explain how surface appeal interventions work, uh, including attractive labels, and also how some emotional interventions work. And the basic idea for all of those is that they refocus initial attention on a different specific choice option. So under one condition, you focus first on one, and under the, the second condition, you focus on the, on, 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 on the other option. So whichever option gets considered first, gets the query theory bump, uh, and first queries don't uh, exhibit any inhibition, and so therefore more arguments, and the balance of evidence, the balance of arguments for one or the other option drives choice, uh, and hence you know, sort of the query theory mechanisms uh, in many situations completely mediate the differences that we see in choice. So thank you so much uh, for giving me so much uh, for, for your finite attention. Uh, and I think uh, we're, we're going back to Chris. Elke, thank you so much. Listen, some questions about that, about query theory. Um, I'm sure it's running through so many different strategists and planners' minds right now that to reassess the order in which choices are presented to people. And of course, context and even mood can make a difference. But if we ask about the order for a moment, when we see it in a monetary decision of the smaller now, larger later, something like a gift card makes clear sense. What about choices that are more intangible um, related to say climate change mitigation actions, things you want people to do that in the long term and in an aggregate might mitigate some of the effects of climate change? How do you use query theory for something like that? Well, I think the second example that I gave about the dirty word was a dirty world study was basically exactly you know, sort of targeted at that. And so I think we have to be very careful. Many, many situations, many decisions that have impact on climate change also have other benefits. You know, people talk about co-benefits. Uh, and so some, some solutions might actually also be good for your health. Uh, some solutions are good for your pocketbook, investing in energy efficiency, for example. So I think the idea would be to use whatever frame, whatever packaging of the option that actually is good for you and for society in the long run to make that as attractive as possible for the, for the audience, for the person that you are, you are, you're attracting. And it's not gonna be the same answer for everyone. So for some of them, it might make sense to talk about the public good. For others, it might make sense to talk about the, the, the pocketbook. And so I think you have to, but as long as you know that your goal is for the person to look at that option that you want to advance first, yeah, then the, the, the choice is up to you how to do that. Terrific. And are there other areas, there must be so many different areas areas for good that we could be doing this in, I mean, be, beyond consumerism. Um, how might that work when you think about a kind of loss aversion for something like health, meaning personal health, trying to convince somebody to vaccinate their child, for example? Mm -hmm. So it, it, one thing I didn't make very clear in, in, in my talk was that query theory actually predicts exactly the same phenomena that prospect theory does. Yeah? It basically just provides you with a lower level psychological process explanations about why prospect theory regularities actually work, work, work the way they do. Uh, and so uh, what, what that means is that sort of you can basically sort of use the same interventions that we've talked about before. And, but I think query theory unifies, you know, sort of uh, helps you understand why they work the way they do. Uh, and sometimes one kind of intervention, like a framing intervention, might, 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 might not be appropriate in a given context. But if you know that the underlying objective uh, is to sort of refocus people's attention on the option that they hopefully will choose down the road, uh, that gives you uh, 
some idea about what other interventions might work. So in the case of COVID, for example, you know, two, two speakers ago, uh, we talked about how to get people to wear masks. Yeah? Uh, and, 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 and for some people, it, that, that might be something that they do because they want to protect themselves. Yeah? Uh, for other people, it might be something that they want to do to protect other people. But if you know, if you, and also getting back to your presentation about individual differences, if you know your target audience, yeah, then you can use that knowledge to think about yeah, which kind of labeling, which kind of frame, which kind of sort of core motivation can you bring to the table that they will look at that option that is in everybody's best interest first. And when you do that, to what degree is there any wiring of the individual that comes into play? Eric Johnson, of course, right before you, somebody I think you know, uh, was talking about testing us for big five personality, for locus of control, regulatory focus, and basically found nothing. How about that with query theory? Does it have greater or lesser impact depending on how I am wired as an individual? Well, it turns out that, for example, the intertemporal choice uh, scenario is being used now in lots of hospitals to, uh, for, for eating disorders. Uh, and, and, and so talk about individual differences, maybe in terms of getting out of the normal spectrum, but into clinical cases, uh, it turns out that you know, sort of self-control, we know from Walter Michel, self-control is a good thing. Yeah? If, you, if, you, if you're waiting for that second marshmallow, you know, the extra 20 minutes, uh, chances are you're gonna be richer, you're gonna be more happily married, you're gonna have more education because self-control is good. But the self-control can also go too far. And talking about wiring, you know, people that either have learned uh, in early childhood experience that sort of they need to exert self-control or they, you know, they might have a, a natural uh, individual difference to be more self-controlling. If you push it too far, uh, some in some situations, people never choose the later, larger later option. Yeah? Uh, and, and so, yes, I, I think there is a tendency to look at one or the other option, perhaps also as a, as a pre-existing pre pre individual differences, all other things being equal. That doesn't mean that some of these interventions we talked about to refocus your attention, just because you have this chronic tendency to latch on one than the other. It doesn't mean that these other situational interventions don't work. So a state versus a trait in that case. A exactly. state can over, overpower a trait. Overpower, yeah. Uh, so one last very quick question from Slido. A viewer has asked, what research question are you dying to tackle next? Well, one thing we're looking at is to what extent, it's not so much related to query theories or maybe sort of somewhat, we're looking at right now, partly because it's this beautiful natural experiment we're giving is what is the effect of, of, of people's experiences with COVID, you know, sort of on, on other social issues, like for example, climate change concern. Uh, and uh, there, you know, sort of one hypothesis that I uh, put forward in 2006 is a finite pool of worry. Uh, and I think the media have been concerned about that. Now, as we're all concerned about, you know, sort of bringing back our economy and, and keeping our uh, uh, parents from dying, uh, we might not be paying attention to climate change so much anymore. It turns out the answer to that actually is not quite so clear cut. You know, so we're, we're exploring, uh, so the interconnection of, of, of perceptions of risk across domains, uh, and also what we maybe can learn in one domain, you know, learning that early responding matters you know, and procrastination actually can have dramatic negative consequences. Is that something that people can carry over from the COVID coronavirus situation to, to climate change mitigation? Really great. Elke, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much. Uh, Dr. Weber, of course, is a professor of just about everything at Princeton, her <laughs> mashup of cross everything thing from energy and the environment and psychology and public affairs and a very deep and rich career. And thanks for sharing that with us today. Appreciate it. Real pleasure, Chris. Bye. Bye. Now, ladies and gentlemen, still to come this afternoon, we have BJ Fogg. You might have heard of BJ Fogg because of the Fogg model. It's every scientist's dream to have an eponymous model. So we're going to hear from him, especially related to the context of COVID. We've got Laurie Santos coming, who is the queen of happiness science. You can't miss that. But let me tell you just a little bit really quickly here about our partners. So our two partners are the B2B Institute and 42 Courses. B2B Institute's a think tank. It's funded by LinkedIn, and it researches the future of B2B marketing and decision-making. Its initial focus is on B2B marketing, which is a large but ill-defined
fine category, and they partner with leading experts in academia and industry to study the impact of B2B brand building on marketing, product, sales, corporate communications, and talent development. While it's funded by LinkedIn, the B2B Institute is an open forum for dialogue from diverse perspectives. We also have 42 courses. The 42 course, course is a new creative e-learning platform. It offers on-demand courses. And in fact, for viewers of Nudgestock, if you want to take the behavioral economics 42 course with Rory Sutherland, who you saw in the prior segment, you can get a discount on that for using hashtag Nudgestock 2020. Nudgestock 2020 is your coupon code for 42 courses. Well, next up, we have Claire Charon and Alistair Rennie, both with Google. And they're wondering how much you can boost a brand's appeal using behavioral science heuristics and biases while people are trying to make a shopping decision online. They're here to tell you about what they found, some very surprising things they found, and um, the messy middle. Here's Claire Charon and Alistair Rennie from Google. Okay, good evening. I'm Ali. And I'm Claire. And thanks for tuning in. This is Decoding Decisions, Making Sense of the Messy Middle. So what is the messy middle? Well, if you cast your minds back 20 years, so we're talking pre-smartphone, pre-internet, Purchases were largely determined by the physical availability of a product and the information available to you at the time. But today, the sheer volume of choice and information online makes this far more complex. So using screen captured video and audio, we've watched literally hundreds of hours of shopping journeys. And today's journey looks something more like this. Now this spaghetti-like space between the trigger and the purchase itself is what we call the messy middle. Now this might look a little bit silly, but it actually makes a serious point. So like I said, we've watched hundreds of hours of shopping behavior, and we've seen consumers go from search engines to review sites, to video sharing sites, to aggregators, to help me out here, Claire. There's also social media, comparison sites, forums, blog sites even. And the list goes on and on. So actually, this model is probably quite accurate. And we had a hunch that all of this complexity wasn't being fully addressed by our uh, current marketing models and possibly even our marketing practices. Now, while this model makes a point, this is, of course, completely useless to all of us. This behavior needs to be codified and it needs to be organized. So before we sort out Ali's spaghetti, it's important to note that all decisions happen against this backdrop of exposure. So it's not a completely new concept. You may know it as awareness, but exposure is so much more than awareness. It can be as big as, as a billboard that you pass on a freeway, but equally it can be as small as a conversation you overhear in a coffee shop. It's always on, importantly, it's always changing, and it remains present at every single stage of the model. So what we've done with all those behaviors that we listed earlier is codify them in two distinct mental modes, exploration and evaluation. So these two things, they can happen sequentially, they can happen simultaneously, but the research and the science has really shown us that these two functions are distinct and they involve different mental processes. So what we've learned is that exploration is an expansive exercise. So here we're adding new brands, new products into our consideration set. And then as we update our prior understanding with all this new information, it needs to be evaluated. And this is very much a reductive exercise. Now, with the sheer amount of choice and all of this information that's readily available at our fingertips at all times, it's rare that we'll just go around this loop once, right? And it's no coincidence that this looks like an infinity loop. I won't even tell you how long it took me to pick out this one gray curtain behind me. Now, like, uh, if you do manage, nice. if you like my brain, thank you. I do, I do. Now, if you do manage to make a decision, which I eventually did, you'll head to purchase and your experience will feed back into exposure. So not just your own exposure, but also the exposure of others should you choose to share your experience. Right, okay, so we explore and we evaluate and the messy middle is now uh, a lot neater, I guess, but the job is only half done because in this world full of so much choice and information, we need to understand how humans manage these mental functions. And what we've learned is that when we're faced with so much choice, we default to cognitive mechanisms 
that actually evolved deep within our pre-digital uh, history and mechanisms that, of course, have been well documented by behavioral scientists. So, in parallel to one of our shopping observations, we conducted a literature review of the decades of behavioral science research. And from the 300 or so cognitive biases and principles, we picked out six that we feel often have a significant or a disproportionate impact as consumers navigate this messy middle. But before we get on, in, uh, before we get into that, a quick word on some boundaries. There's no brand strategy here, okay? And equally, price is off the table. Now, these things are hugely important, but they're not so easily changed, okay? But that leaves us with this eminently playable space in the middle where executing some of these biases requires sometimes just a cosmetic change or maybe just uh, reprioritizing some existing content. So right. our six chosen biases are... They are, we'll start with category heuristics. So these are essentially shortcuts that help us make decisions. So this is, for example, you're in the supermarket shopping for food and you see the word organic stamped on an item. And this tells you several things about this item just in that one word. We also have the authority bias, and this is around the fact that we like following the lead of credible or knowledgeable experts in that particular field. Okay, so one example here that I like is, is this is like a central bank telling you that the housing market will never collapse. Right. So there's also scarcity. Uh, probably a lot of you are familiar with this, right? The more scarce something is, the more appealing and desirable it is to us. Okay, so a typical example here is you're booking a hotel online and you can see that it only has three rooms left. We also have the power of free, and this is that disproportionate pull that that word free has. Yeah, and we all love a freebie, and sometimes this, this freebie doesn't have anything to do with the product itself. Then there's social proof. This is also called the herd instinct and really about the fact that we look to what others think or what they're doing. So the common execution is a five-star review when we're shopping online. And finally, we have the power of now. So evolutionarily, we're wired to really live in the present, really living in the here and now. And I like this one because it explains why perhaps I'm not very good at going on a diet or saving money. But if you tell me I can have something that I've ordered tomorrow, then this really has a huge appeal for me. So those are our six biases. There's nothing new there, but what we've done what we're going to do is systematically test and validate these at scale. And the way we've done that is in a simulated purchase environment, okay? So we've picked out 31 products, and these products represent a range of different levels of complexity and different levels of risk. And we've recruited 1,000 in-market shoppers for each of these products, and each shopper did 10 simulations. So that gives us a total of 310,000 simulated purchase scenarios. How much? <laughs> 310,000 simulated purchases. It's a big number. Right. Get on, get on with it. Get on with it. All right. Now, before we started the simulation, we asked shoppers to tell us what their favorite brand is and also what their second favorite brand is. And then we've used these six biases to try and tempt the shopper away from their favorite brand to what at least they perceive to be an inferior brand. And it turns out that you don't actually need all the fix to do this. And as an example, we're going to take a quick look at the simulation for mortgages. Now, this is a fiercely competitive market and it's a big risky purchase. So it actually makes a very good case study. So this is what the simulation looks like. So we house it in a debranded retail environment and we have the favorite brand on the left hand side, the second favorite brand on the right. And then in these smaller boxes, we execute the six different biases that we picked out in our literature review. And now what we can do is we can then chop and change these and we're able to quantify the impact of this in the controlled environment. That's right. So at the start of the simulation, the shopper gives us their favorite brand. And in that one fleeting top of mind moment, that brand enjoys, we can say, 100% share of the preference. But then we start the simulation. And the first thing we do is just to quantify the presence of that second choice brand on a level playing field. So here you can see both propositions are identical. The only difference is the brand. But it turns out that just by showing up at the right time, that second choice brand has taken a third of the share of preference. Okay, but that's just the start because now we're gonna take that second choice brand and we're gonna charge it. And we do that by giving it superior executions for two out of the six cognitive biases, okay? So we're gonna start by providing some powerful shortcuts, some powerful shortcuts for the heuristics. But the highlight here is we're going to give that second choice brand 
a 500 pound cash back as part of its proposition versus a free valuation for the favorite brand. Now, given that this is a typically large uh, and very long, like 25 year long loan, if we were as rational as I guess classical economics, ec economists would have us believe, then this really shouldn't make much of a difference, but. It does. So now over half of shoppers have switched from their favorite brand to their second choice brand. Now that really is the power of free. That is the power of free. So but now we're not gonna stop there, of course. We're gonna throw the book at it quite literally. We're gonna supercharge that second choice brand. And now we're gonna do that across all six of these cognitive biases. We haven't got time to go through them all. But some of the highlights here are the five-star review that we've given the second choice brand, which provides increased social proof instead of just three stars for the favorite. We're also going to add in uh, a more powerful source of authority bias or a more, a more powerful source of authority for that second choice brand. Right. So now we have that second choice brand. It's supercharged. And with that being supercharged, three quarters of shoppers have now switched to that second choice brand. So really, this is a really powerful demonstration of how humans default to these mechanisms when managing choice and information in the messy middle. It is worth remembering, though, that that second choice brand, although it is technically the second favorite, it's still a powerful brand. But what happens when we remove that power from the equation? Well, this is plus building society. OK, now you've never heard of this brand. The reason why you've never heard of it is because we've conjured it out of thin air. This is a researcher's idea of, of fun. No, this is Ali's idea of fun. Okay, yeah, maybe it's just my idea of fun. Thanks, Claire. Um, but what we've done here is effectively we've removed the exposure element from the equation. Okay, so this brand has zero equity. Okay, but we've supercharged it just like we did for that second favorite brand, and then we've put it up against the market leaders. Now, alarmingly, or perhaps you know, excitingly, depending on your perspective, when supercharged, this plus building society has acquired nearly two thirds share of preference from that favorite brand. Okay, quick point here though, even with a weaker proposition, over a third stuck with their favorite brand. So you can see brands really still are all powerful, but in a world of this you know, abundant information and choice, we're just showing that there are other powerful factors at play here as well. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the same simulation for all 31 products. And we're gonna sum up by making three points in three charts in under three minutes, okay? So firstly, simply showing up can impact decisions in the messy middle. What you're seeing here is all 31 products. The blue is the first choice brand, the yellow is the second choice brand, and consistently across all 31 of these products, all a competitor had to do to take significant share of preference was just to show up. Now, the second point is all about intelligent use of behavioral science principles in the messy middle. So here, again, we're looking at those 31 products, but in this case, it's after we've charged that second choice brand with superior executions for two of the six biases. Now, small changes obviously can have a big impact. And as we've seen with that mortgage example, it's really not always an entirely rational discovery that determines the outcome. And then finally, very quickly, by understanding human behavior in this way, we can close the gap between trigger and purchase in the messy middle. Now, we saw this with Plus Building Society, but of course, we didn't stop there. We created another 30 fake brands to take on the market leaders. And what you're looking at here is the simulation results after we had fully supercharged all of those fake brands. Now, it's worth noting that a fake brand in our simulation is a pretty good proxy for a new challenger in the real world. And if that seems far-fetched, it's worth remembering that marketing history is littered with stories of challenger brands that seemingly came out of nowhere and took a significant share of the market. Okay, so hopefully we've made some sense of the messy middle. The full research will be available in mid-July in an ebook, so please do check it out. And all that's left to say is thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> that's the sound of our nut stock viewers having just watched you guys blow up everything they thought they knew about brand love you're telling us that you can create a fictional brand as a challenger brand and go head to head and by pulling a few heuristic and cognitive bias levers you've completely reshaped the landscape come on <laughs> Okay, okay, don't worry. I think everyone can stop having heart attacks because we're not, we're definitely not saying that brands aren't, aren't important, right? So it's actually the opposite. The brand is probably the single most powerful heuristic in our test, right? So what, what gives you all that important head start in the first place? 
Um, and I think, you know, what we've seen is that even with that weaker proposition, right? So when that favorite brand has the, those inferior executions of behavioral science, some of these brands are still hanging on to a huge, you know, quite significant chunk of customers when they're up against that supercharged alternative. Mm -hmm. And when you charge or supercharge the favorite brand, it becomes really all powerful. Yeah, that's right. And just to just to follow on from that point, Claire, it's it, we mustn't forget that brands represent a really significant invest of time and resource and all that creative energy. But what the research is telling us is that given that a competitor needs only show up at the right time to acquire some share, there's a good chance that we may not be getting the optimal return on that investment. So at, what we're saying is, is to use these insights to strengthen your brand in the messy middle, protect your customers, avoid that competitive disruption and get a better return on those big brand investments. Brand and, one is key. and one question that came up in, in prior uh, sessions about not just the overarching umbrella of cognitive biases and heuristics that have an impact on all humans, but individuals may be wired slightly differently and more susceptible to certain things. Were you finding any evidence of that? Yeah, it was quite interesting, actually. We did do a segmentation, just a natural segmentation, to see how it would naturally fall out in terms of which respondents had um, you know, selected which, which biases within our simulation. And one of the natural breakouts was actually for a particularly younger demographic. Social proof tended to be uh, more important to them than the median, uh, as well as power of now, right? So you can imagine that younger generation really conditioned to you know, be quite impatient. They're they're used to getting things quickly. So power of now was was quite important to that uh, particular demographic. Yeah, and I, I guess we'd make the point also though that the executions that we've used in our simulated purchase, none of these are recommendations, right? There's there's no recommendations here. What we're doing is demonstrating how powerful these things can be in a simulated environment. And then the recommendation is to take this and build your own execution based on your markets, based on your particular segments and your customers, and then see what is uh, most effective in that context. Context is so powerful in behavioral science studies and including creating reproducibility issues on occasion because you're not in the same context. And while uh, simulations and lab experiments are, are rife, there is some criticism about this kind of clinical approach that it's not really in the context of somebody distractedly walking along in the street, you know, with their search engine on their, their mobile. Is there any merit to thinking that there would be a different outcome in a messier environment in terms of context? Yeah, I, I fully expect and hope that there is because not only is it messier, I mean, you've got to remember that the executions in our simulation are terribly bland, right? It's just black and white text. And if imagine if you, you know, you, know you, you throw some creative energy behind that, what you can do to really amplify the effects of those biases. Again, it's, it comes back to what the, the previous point we made. All this should be is merely provocation for going doing real live in market testing in your own markets. Because yes, because of the effects that it was a simulated environment. Yes, because our creative application was incredibly weak. It had to be to, to, to simulate it in a controlled environment. But really, it's about it's about doing your own tests in market to make up for the, any shortcomings that our simulation might have. What our simulation shows is just how fluid decision making can be when there is so much information and so much choice. And last question, this was really about brands and products or implied products. Would it work for issues, do you think, when you think about health-related issues or you think about um, whether we should stay in or reopen or are we reopening too quickly? Should we vaccinate our kids? I mean, do you think there's an issue test here that could be done? So are we speaking about so what in, in terms of COVID, in terms of lockdown and, and, and that kind of context? Yeah, that, that could be well, one of think, them, yes. Yeah, so I, I think the, the, the model we presented, for example, is I think more important now in the context of COVID. So the middle is essentially messier. We've accelerated it. Lots of digital behavior has been accelerated. And we're now seeing more exploration. We're seeing more evaluation. You can see clues to this on, uh, on Google Trends. For example, you see that the way people are searching suggests that they are doing more exploration, they're doing more evaluation. And we think exposure is more important too. And of course, what Google has played in terms of search has played a very non-commercial role uh, as well in disseminating COVID information. So we've seen, uh, we, you know, we've got access to a lot of data on that. But really, I think if it's worth going on Google Trends and exploring all that. 
uh, I suggest that to the whole audience to go and do that because you know we've captured a lot of really interesting behavior that really tells a story during, uh, during the COVID crisis. Claire, Ali, both of Google, thanks so much for bringing that to us and great stuff for others to now take on board and begin to test. Appreciate that. Thanks for having us. You're welcome, very welcome. And thank you. Thank you very much. Nudstock viewers, stay right with us. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. And we're getting lots and lots of questions about how you can follow up, how you can find sessions that you may have missed. And by the way, we've been going on now for, oh gosh, about 12 hours. So there is lots you, you can get. And here's how you can do it. You can go to nudgestock.co.uk where you'll find more information about the Obehave podcast, about the Conversations That Matter webinar, register to get videos and more information. And now, let me tell you a little bit about our next guest. He's the reason why I do 30 push-ups before I get in the shower. Yes, he's BJ Fogg, and it's every scientist's fantasy to have an effect or a model named for them. I mean, heck, just look at Dunning-Kruger. What a joy to know that every oblivious idiot in the world carries your name. But not so with the fog model. Fog is used everywhere. And if you're not using it, you should. You're going to see more about it right now. BJ runs the research lab at Stanford, and he's been there for a very long time. And we all know that whether scientists are, are not, that changing habits among the species we call humans is nearly impossible, or at least feels that way. But BJ has taught more than 400,000 people how to change their habits. You could see his book, Tiny Habits, for example, and how many others how to engineer behavior change. And in a time of COVID, that's super important. So BJ Fogg, over to you. Hi, everybody. I am so glad to be here today. I'm here with Frog and Monkey. They usually come with me on my talks and trainings. They are not part of the program today. I'm setting them aside. And Chris, thank you for the intro. I need to correct one thing. Um, it's not 400,000 people. I've personally coached 40,000, kind of important. And I've done that through email since 2011. In fact, it's more than that, but I stopped counting at 40,000. It's more like 60,000. That's a, a kind of an important correction. I, I'm really big on accuracy. 
But let me dive into what we're talking about today. Um, there has been a problem in the world of behavior change is that people cannot think clearly about how behavior really works. This is a problem for everyday people that think it's all about motivation and they get stuck. It's a problem for people like us who are designing products and services. And sometimes the more you read, the more confused you get about how behavior really works. Well, what I'm hoping to do today and the short time that I have is to give you some breakthrough insights about how to think about behavior systematically and clearly and give you superpowers in the next 17 minutes and 20 seconds of thinking about behavior and also designing for behavior change accurately. Behavior is systematic. If it feels confusing and jumbled, what I want you to do is set that aside and start thinking about behavior in a fresh new way. There is a system behind behavior. And over the last 10 years, I've developed a new set of models and a new set of methods. And together, I call this behavior design, not behavioral design. In 2011, we renamed my lab at Stanford to the Behavior Design Lab. That's what I call my work. Now, my new book, Tiny Habits, yes, it's entitled Tiny Habits, but it's really about behavior design. Uh, everything you see in the box there, those models and methods, those are new models, those are new methods, and I cover those things in the book with a special emphasis on the tiny habits method. I'll just touch a little bit on tiny habits today, but mostly I'm going to talk about the fog behavior model. Oh, if you're in the UK, this is what the cover of the book looks like too. So the fog behavior model, I'm going to show you how to use my model to think about behavior over time. Some people have assumed that the behavior model is just a snapshot in time and that's it. No, there's ways you can think about what happens over time. And that's the thing that has interested me the most. So I'll lay the foundation for you now and hopefully going forward so you can think about behavior clearly and be more effective in your work. So my behavior model is this. Behavior happens when three things come together at the same moment. There's motivation to do the behavior. There's ability to do the behavior, and there's a prompt. And when those three things converge, a behavior happens, whether you want it to happen or not. And it's always a function of those three things. Now, I used to call the prompt a trigger. And uh, two years ago, I changed it to prompt. Trigger was a confusing word. And so it is now called prompt. And what I mean by that is anything that says do the behavior now. Your phone ringing is a prompt. A stoplight changing is a prompt. Uh, something that says click here is a prompt. And so this is the current and final form of behavior model, M, A, and P. Now you can use this for many things, including thinking about how to stop a behavior. So if you wanna stop a behavior, if you can get rid of motivation or reduce it, the behavior will diminish or stop. If you can make the behavior harder to do or impossible, you stop the behavior. And if you can remove the prompt, you can stop the behavior. The model itself is universal. It applies to all cultures and all ages. The individual differences and the cultural differences come in on the three components. What motivates individuals differ. And even in different cultures, different things motivate people. So this is where the differences come in. People's ability differs, and within cultures, there's different uh, ability factors and characteristics, and there are differences in how you prompt individual or how you prompt people within cultures. So B equals MAP is universal. The individual or cultural differences happen within the components. To visualize the model in two dimensions gives us even more insight and clarity and power, and that's what I'm going to focus on now. Um, along one axis, you have level of motivation. Motivation for any given behavior can range from high to low. Then you have ability to do the behavior, and that ranges from high to low. But on the right side, I write it up as easy to do. That's the same thing as high ability, but you're gonna see later that calling it easy to do is more helpful. And then there's a prompt, and prompt is like lightning happening. It's a moment in time. It's not well represented on a two-dimensional graphic like this. And then there's an action one. And this is really, uh, the new stuff I'll be showing you uh, is highlighting how this action line works. And this is really important. 
And if somebody is prompted when they're above the action line, when they have some combination of motivation and ability, they do the behavior. So everything in the upper right-hand corner, anything above the action line, I call the action zone. And somebody can be anywhere above the action line when prompted, they do the behavior. In contrast, if they're below the action line, they don't do the behavior when prompted. You're gonna see some examples of this coming up. Now the action line is super important. I've never shared it quite in this way before, but I wanna be really clear. The behavior model makes some assertions. And one of the assertions is this, the higher the level of motivation, the more likely the behavior will happen. Now, you know this from your personal experience, the more motivated somebody is to do something, the more likely they are to do it. But in the model, and notice how this works on the action line, as motivation goes up, so look at the orange bar, as that goes up, there's more and more likelihood that somebody is above the action line. And if motivation is extremely high, well, it's extremely likely that somebody will do the behavior. And as motivation drops, it becomes less likely. So notice how the action line, that curve helps show that. Now, at the same time, the action line also applies to ability. And I'm gonna start here by showing, let's imagine, well, the assertion here is the harder the behavior is to do, the less likely it has happened. And you know this from your personal experience. If you're asking somebody to donate $10,000, which is hard to do, that's uh, less likely to happen than asking somebody for 10 cents. So let's visualize it on the model. So as a behavior gets harder to do, so as the line moves toward hard to do, then there's less and less likelihood that somebody is above the action line. And so if it gets really hard to do, there, it might require high levels of motivation to do. Low levels of motivation won't uh, get somebody to the behavior. And finally, if it gets so hard to do that it's impossible, then you won't do the behavior. That's why in the upper left-hand corner of my model, there's this gap. If behaviors are impossible, like so hard to do that they're impossible, no level of motivation will get somebody to do that behavior. So often people think of the FOG behavior model as something to help you understand one-time behaviors, and that's true. But what I'm gonna focus on from here forward for the next 11 minutes and five seconds is to use the behavior model to understand how behavior happens over time. And you can think of this as behavior sequences. Behavior one leads to behavior two, leads to behavior three, and so on. And this is the area that I'm pretty obsessed about and the current project in my Stanford lab. Each one of these behaviors has its own behavior model associated with it. So behavior one, in order for it to happen, there has to be some level of motivation, ability, and a prompt, which then leads to behavior two, behavior, behavior three, and so on. So, and each one of these behaviors help the subsequent behavior to happen. So behavior one increases ability perhaps for behavior two. Behavior two increases motivation and so on. There's more from me and my lab coming on this. Uh, it's kind of geeky right now, but we're developing a notation system to write out how behavior happens over time. And here's an example of what it looks like. I'm not gonna go deep into this. This is a little bit of a teaser of what's coming. What I do have for you today that's new and not shown before are some videos, some dynamic visualizations of how behavior happens over time. And I have a handful of examples to show you some typical behavior patterns, mapping them to the behavior model. This first video will show you how motivation fluctuates over time and in this case, motivation drops. Somebody starts super motivated to do something and it's something hard and as motivation drops, they can no longer do it. Sound familiar? Yeah, it's human nature. We set ourselves up to do hard things and in some ways to fail. Let's watch a video that uh, shows how this works from the behavior model. And so let's play video number one. Glenn works in insurance but he does not like his job. He wants a career in software development. So Glenn signs up for an online course to learn JavaScript. The course takes 10 weeks. Glenn must do one hour of homework each day to pass. During week one, Glenn is super motivated. He does his homework and delivers his JavaScript projects on time. 
during week two, Glenn starts to struggle. His motivation sags, and he doesn't do his homework reliably. Glenn thinks about all of the money he spent to take the JavaScript course, and this temporarily motivates him to do the required homework. During week three, his motivation tanks. Learning JavaScript is hard, and he can't find out how to motivate himself to do the work. Glenn misses deadline after deadline and finally drops the course. Damn, did that look familiar? Yeah, that happens all too often. And too often when we create products and programs, we set people up to fail by making it hard to do. Next video is about how motivations can conflict with each other. Part of you wants to do it, part of you doesn't want to do it. And it's going to be applied to a topic that's familiar to all of us right now, which is wearing masks. So let's play the next video that shows the dynamic nature of motivation and how they can be conflicting motivators. Meet Jake. He does not wear a mask when shopping. He sort of believes a mask will protect him from COVID-19. However, the only mask he owns is painful to wear. So this adds up to not wearing a mask. He is below the action line. Then one day, Jake's grandma made him a mask that was comfortable, not at all painful. She gave it with a note. Please wear this to protect yourself and me. This changed things for Jake. Now above the action line, Jake wears a mask when shopping. Jake wore his mask reliably until Jake watched a TV program saying masks aren't very effective at protecting you. In addition, one guy on the program said the whole mask thing was a conspiracy to control citizens, make them sheep. Jake believed it. Despite his grandma's pleas, Jake no longer wears a mask. Damn. So motivations can conflict with each other pushing people up or down in relationship to the action line. And you could write this out, behavior one, behavior two, behavior three, and so on. The next visualization has to do with how motivation grows over time. This is almost the opposite of the first video where uh, the motivation went down. In this case, motivation grows. And notice that it grows because somebody feels successful and then they can do harder and harder things. So let's play the next video. Jeff loves music. So for Christmas, his niece gets him a musical instrument called a kalimba. This is nothing like a piano or guitar. To Jeff, it's just plain confusing. But the kalimba was a gift, so he feels obligated to practice a little bit every day. At first, Jeff plays the kalimba for just three or four minutes each morning. It feels like a chore but he practices taking baby steps each time. After a week or so, Jeff's brain starts to understand kalimba better. It's not so confusing, and the music he plays sounds better and better. He starts to practice longer each day, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Jeff quickly gets better on kalimba, and he feels successful playing, so he keeps going. Some days he will practice for 30 minutes, sometimes for an hour. He pushes himself most days. Can he play simple pieces by Mozart? Yep. Let's see about jazz. Hmm, pretty good. How about a nocturne by Chopin? Well, he plans to tackle that one in his next practice session. So the videos you saw, the preceding videos were all about motivation and how it works, but we can also look at how ability works in relationship to the action line. And this video shows specifically that when you make something easier to do, you don't have to fuss around with motivation. You can get people over the action line. So let's watch the next video that shows this dynamic. Carmen knows it's important to eat fresh vegetables every day, but in her new job, she's busy. When she gets home from work, all she can manage is popping a frozen pizza into the microwave. Part of her brain seems to say, hey, Carmen, you know vegetables would serve you so much better. But another part of her brain says, oh, that's hard work. Buying the veggies, washing them, cutting, cooking, cleaning up. 
So Carmen feels this struggle inside. She wants to eat fresh veggies, but she just can't seem to find enough motivation. At the grocery store one day, Carmen discovers something new. Fresh vegetables already washed, cut, and ready to cook. The veggies are even packaged into portions, with seasoning on the side. Wow, Carmen thinks. This seems so easy to do. She buys enough veggies for the rest of the week. To her delight, each evening after work, she finds herself preparing, yes, fresh vegetables for dinner. She realizes this truth. Simplicity changes behavior. So as you saw, by making things easier to do, you can uh, put yourself or others over the action line, but the reverse is true as well if you make something harder to do. There's also ways to use the behavior model to think about how you change a choice. And we won't play this video right now, but you can go to behaviormodel.org to see how you can think clearly about choices and changing choices using the behavior model. And one of the takeaways here is people don't always choose the thing they're most motivated to do. If it's much easier to do, they might choose something that they're less motivated to do, but it's easier to do. The last video is about prompts in populations. So I'm doing two new things at once. Now this video is about how prompts work, but also how the behavior model can be applied to populations. Uh, so let's watch this next video. Stanford University asks their 200,000 alumni to donate every year. One objective is to increase the percent of alumni who donate annually. Let's suppose that Stanford typically asks alumni to donate $100. At any given moment, if Stanford prompts alumni to donate, perhaps 15% will take action immediately. They are already above the action line. That's okay, but savvy fundraisers know that when you're asking for money, the timing of the request makes a big difference. You don't want to prompt alumni to donate after Stanford gets bad press. The alumni at that moment would be less motivated and the response rate would drop. And you don't want to prompt alumni to donate after a financial crisis strikes. <laughs> Again, the response rate would be lower because most alumni would feel they have less money to give, making the $100 donation seem harder to do. Yes, the timing of the prompt matters. Savvy fundraisers, at least for annual giving, want to prompt donations when the greatest percentage of alumni are above the action line. This could be after Stanford wins a national championship in basketball, or even better, right after Stanford researchers discover a cure for COVID-19. In this case, the percentage of alumni over the action line would surge probably giving record-breaking results. There's another way fundraisers can maximize the percent of alumni donating. They can make it easier to do. For example, Stanford could reduce the donation request from $100 to $20. While this may lead to fewer dollars donated in total, the percent of alumni donating would go up. And when it comes to annual giving at Stanford, the focus is on level of participation, the percent of alumni donating. It's not the total dollars donated. So <laughs> if Stanford can't find a good moment of high motivation for their alumni, well, you know, like a cure for COVID-19, then reducing the suggested donation may be the best solution. Well, I hope those videos helped you see how to use the FOG behavior model in new ways. Takeaways. As you think clearly about human behavior, you can use this version of the model. You can think of it in this way, or you can think of it as sequences, whichever one is most appropriate for what you're doing. The tiny habits method, the method that I've coached over 40,000 people in, the method that is, I think, the simplest and fastest way to create habits comes from me looking at my own model. I understood that making things easier to do would get people over the action line. And then I saw here like, wow, the habit's really easy to do. Motivation can be high or low. 
In contrast, if you make the habit hard to do, then when motivation drops, they stop doing it. So then I started goofing around with my own habits, making them super easy to do, which then led to sharing it with others. And I started teaching it in 2011 online in a free five-day program. So there you have it. Behavior design is a system. The cornerstone of it is the fog behavior model. And I shared some new aspects of that today, the dynamics of human behavior. I'm hoping this helps you go from being stuck to unstuck, giving you superpowers. You can find more in the book. You can find more at tinyhabits.com. You especially can go to behavior model. Like this presentation was mostly about behavior model and not tiny habits. And I hope this gives you breakthroughs. And if you really want to up your game, there is a professional boot camp that I do once a month, just 12 people on Zoom. Email me and we can talk about if that's appropriate for you. Thank you very much. Chris. DJ Fogg, thank you very much. Listen, we're going to get in a couple of quick questions here. One is from somebody quite astute, clearly in the behavior change business or science. How do we decide between a health belief model, a calm B model, a triandus model, and the fog model? There are other models out there. And the calm yeah. B, for example, is capability, opportunity, and motivation. It sounds a lot like the B map. It sounds kind of derivative of my model, yes. Of course, I'm biased. I think the FOG behavior model is the right one to use. Motivation, ability, and prompt are discrete concepts. They're not overlaps. The action line is critical. You can see without the action line, we don't really understand how behavior works. So everybody's going to have their opinion and bias. And of course, I have mine. I encourage people to learn how to use the behavior model and see how it works. Next. Next question is, is there a way to calculate the action line or is it always a subjective? Oh, I love that. The way it's drawn on the model, it's a conceptual curve, but there are people in the industry that are mapping populations to the action line and saying, okay, 20% of people are answering the survey. If we increase motivation, how much lift do we get? If we make the survey easier to do, how much lift do we get? And they're making strategic decisions on product design and interventions based on what they're seeing in their data. So you don't have to have the perfect shape of the line. If you can map a population, you could even sample a population and say, what happens when we increase motivation in this way? Or if you wanna help people stop behaviors, how do we make it harder to do and what kind of impact does that have? BJ Fogg, listen, thanks very much. And Nudge Stock viewers stick with us because next up a crucial conversation about diversity or lack of diversity in behavioral science, including are we too weird? Stay with us.
Welcome back to Nudge Stock. And you know, just as with many fields, behavioral science has been examining its own clear lack of diversity. When you study human behavior as an expertise, it might make a difference if you studied more than one kind of human. And in behavioral science, the criticism has been for a while, we're too weird. Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, and you can probably add a couple of others like male and white and older, but uh, it makes a big difference at a couple levels. It makes a big difference in the people we study, and it makes a big difference in the people that we want to be the talent in the industry, whether they are students, professors, or practitioners. And joining us now to take on that challenge of discussing this are Sarita Bethe, she is the head of behavioral science at Coca-Cola, Neela Saldana with the Busara Center for Behavioral Economics. It's a research and advisory firm dedicated to advancing and applying behavioral science for poverty alleviation in the global South. And Grace Lorden, Associate Professor of Behavioral Science at the London School of Economics. Grace, over to you. Thank you all for tuning in tonight. So if you are a behavioral scientist sitting out there, you'll know that we do tend to study time. So thank you for giving us the privilege of your time. I'm going to speak specifically about weirdness in academia. Um, this is the place where students often get inspired and often make a decision about whether they will actually become a behavioral scientist through taking a module or taking a degree. Um, students will certainly get looked to the faculty they meet for inspiration along the way. Um, the first thing that I want to, rec want to recognize is that behavioral science isn't in itself not a discipline, and it does rely on investigations that come from a number of disciplines, the majority coming from economics and psychologists at the moment. So what I mean by that, if you look around the world and you look at who's branding themselves as behavioral scientists, normally they will have come through either an economics or psychology major and then gone on to do some other masters. Um, within this, development economists, I think, have pushed the frontier. Um, not just in behavioral science, actually, but in economics in general. And they ha have done this by producing an emerging stock of knowledge that relies on field experiments to understand behavior in a variety of contexts, lots of different countries, and more and more often modeling effects in the short run and the long run. They consider high stake decisions that, that really affect real people. They look at adaptation. They think about heterogeneous treatment effects, and they discuss general equilibrium effects. And this is where I would really love to see the, the field of behavioral science go in general. Because outside development economics, behavioral science academic research is very more most focused on weird samples. As we've already heard, that's Western, educated, industrialized, rich, developed countries. And it's even more than that. So we tend to focus on highly selected samples, over relying on our own students and survey respondents as samples, looking at questions that involve low stakes and looking at very short run effects, very different to the development economists that are up here. And the question then becomes, well, why this research? Well, firstly, the majority of behavioral science modules and degrees are in Western educated rich developed countries, mainly in the UK, Ireland and the US. Um, and secondly, these studies are actually pretty useful as a first pass to understand um, human behavior. So they do have a place in the literature. Thirdly, they are actually very cheap to do time-wise and universities that have behavioral science modules and faculty usually have the structures and resources that make this type of research easy to conduct. And this is a barrier to entry for behavioral science research. And we lose a lot in this pattern by over-focusing on weird samples. So one thing we know for sure as behavioral scientists is that context matters. And by not moving outside such selected samples often enough, we now know too little about behavioral science lessons that are core to human behavior and those that are born out of studying a specific context. This is really important because we're living in a globalized world. So learning whether some of the facts coming out of small weird studies replicated more interesting populations in the weird countries themselves and beyond is necessary to demonstrate how useful behavioral science is. On this, I think academics and behavioral science, uh, uh, academics who are behavioral scientists in weird countries that already have the structures and resources in place need to start more actively building partnership with academics, think tanks and firms in non-weird countries and just get on with doing research that's outside the weird context. This will give us immediate role models for our students outside the university and the collaborations will obviously bear obvious fruit for learning. 
in the spirit of avoiding virtue signaling, which I think is going to be a theme for our panel tonight, and moving towards more committed action, I'm actually setting up a research centre at the LSE in November called the Inclusion Initiative. And I've already committed to taking learnings from the lab into firms in London. Um, so for Nudge Stock tonight, I'm also going to commit to doing this in non-weird settings by building the type of partnerships that I've just described. But let's go back to the students now. So universities in North America and the UK are actually de uh, creating designated behavioral science departments and hubs that are awarding degrees to students on this topic. I'm a director of an MSc in behavioral science at the LSC. And I'm pleased to say that the students do come from around the world. We have a great representation in the classroom of non rare countries. We have a fantastic pipeline. Let's keep that global pipeline. Let's keep them looking at global questions. But the faculty that face these students are not diverse. Uh, for example, the share of males in these universities is more greater than 75%. I spent some time today working that out. And more than 90% of the faculty are coming from weird countries themselves. So it's important that universities look at their own hiring practice and prevent against the biases that they study themselves, like familiarity bias, affinity bias, and the halo effect. In addition, we should move as universities away from relying on signals that don't necessarily in always indicate talent, such as having gone to an elite university and fish in a wider pool that is truly global. Finally, it is also important that universities start, and I think this is actually necessary for all disciplines that have a pipeline problem, to hire senior faculty that have a revealed history of nurturing global talent. This is a valuable trait in a new hire, and it's easily visible in a person's CV, so we don't need to rely on, on what they say, we can look at what they've done in the past. But hiring shifts like this do take time, so it's therefore a good idea to pay attention to what we're actually teaching our students now by having an inclusive curriculum, making sure that we have papers that are from around the world and we're honest about our students about gaps in the literature. We also need to encourage our students in their own research to consider questions that are beyond weird. This is obviously easier if we're doing it ourselves, echoing the importance of partnership buildings. I've already committed to this, but I am one person. So if you're out there tonight and you're an academic in behavioral science or conduct research in behavioral science, maybe you can do the same. If we get to critical mass, we also get to a tipping point that can cause real change, which would be a super cool legacy for Nudge Stock Virtual 2020. Thank you all for listening. And I'm now gonna hand over to the fantastic Mia. Thank you, Grace. Uh, I think you echoed a lot of what I'm going to say. Uh, so we're just going to talk a little bit about my experience actually setting up a behavioral science unit in one of those non-weird countries, which is India. But before that, and this is on my bucket list of things to do, I've always wanted to tell this joke in a party. So, you know, what better than 30,000 people at this nudge stock party? So there's this, uh, there's this man coming after a party. He's a little worse for wear and he's under the street light and he's desperately searching for something. And the Good Samaritan comes up and says, what are you searching for? And he says, I've lost my keys. So they both get around to searching and after you know, hours of fruitless searching, they can't find the keys. So the, the Good Samaritan says, look, we searched everywhere. Are you sure you've dropped your keys here? And so the man says, uh, oh no, I'm pretty sure I haven't dropped my keys here. Actually, I think I dropped them at that corner on the side of the road. <laughs> and the Good Samaritan says, then, why are we searching for your keys here if you didn't drop them here? And the drunk man says, oh, that's easy because the light is much better here. And sometimes I feel, you know, in behavioral science that we are those drunk men where we're searching for our keys, uh, you know, where the light is better rather than where the problems actually are. And although you mentioned, Grace, that it's better in development, I still think we have a long way to go. So in 2017, I moved from New York uh, to New Delhi, India to head up and to set up a center for social and behavior change at Ashoka University. And the center was funded by a grant from the Gates Foundation. So it's very excited, as you can tell, to sort of kickstart some of that behavioral science capability. And it was an exhilarating journey, but it was also a very hard journey. Um, and, you know, in retrospect, looking back, I, I want to lay out some of those barriers based on my experience. Uh, and I'll use the behavioral insights theme, fabulous East framework. You know, we need to make something easy, attractive, social, and timely. So as you mentioned, it's not easy to set up this behavioral science capability because of the talent pipeline. There's a mismatch between talented professionals and uh, what they need to learn in terms of behavioral science. In a country like India, there, there isn't actually uh, even a behavioral science course or training that people can take. Uh, second, uh, there is no research infrastructure. So you have all these great insights, you want to run experiments, especially with low income and marginalized populations, how are you going to do that? Uh, it takes forever to run that. 
it's not attractive. Uh, there's no incentives for Global North researchers actually to work with folks in the Global South or non-weird countries. Uh, and the demand from local decision makers is also quite tentative because they haven't seen this work in their country. So it's not attractive to, to start something. It's definitely not social. You know, many times we felt you're the lonely warrior. There's no community. But it was timely. I will say that. Uh, it was timely to start to think about that. There was a lot of interest. So I want to talk about one solution because you did talk, Grace, about partnerships. And you talked about partnership between uh, universities in the UK, with LSE and others. I want to talk about a particular partnership, which is a South-South partnership which is partnerships between non-weird countries themselves. And remember that's 88% of the world's population. So there's a lot of scope for partnerships there. So when I was at the center, we actually uh, had this partnership with Busara, with the Busara Center for Behavioral Economics. And that's because you know we thought that instead of tying up, and not instead of, but in addition to tying up with a lot of the well-known behavior science folks, why not look for someone who had tried to solve the same challenges in the same low resource settings? Uh, and lo and behold, Basara headquartered in Nairobi had been doing that in Kenya and Tanzania and Nigeria. Um, so it was a great partnership. We worked on a project uh, to look at how we might increase our consumption of iron and folic acid tablets amongst anemic women. These are rural pregnant women. Uh, what might we do? Um, and it was great because it wasn't the right thing to do, which of course it was, but it was also great because we were both sharing similar challenges. So we set up the research infrastructure uh, you know, we had this this very cool bus that we took out and outfitted with laptops and actually went to the rural villages instead of having them come to uh, the lab. It was attractive because once we, we ran about five experiments, we were able to show the results of that to policymakers and to decision makers. And so people began to say, oh, that's what you mean by behavioral science applied to my problem. I get that now. So we saw a lot more demand. And of course, you know, nothing better than having someone else facing the same challenges to actually have to talk to. So it really helped to build that community. So I do think one of the missing links that we, uh, we should really be working on right now is the sort of non-weird or South-South partnerships in addition to North-South partnerships. And these already exist. Uh, so, you know, what I've been working on in the last few months is really trying to do that on a regional basis. Uh, and I would call on everyone to uh, to set those goals. We know from uh, behavioral science research, from the work of Locke and Latham, that setting specific goals is better than a do your best. So I'm going to exhort everyone at Nutstalk not to think about doing their best, but to set specific goals. If you're a funder, you know, commit to funding this work as the Gates Foundation did for two to three years. If you're a professional, commit to working on one of these. Uh, set set a specific goal. I'm going to, going to end with just this startling statistic. You talked about a tipping point, Grace, and I was reading the work by Erica Chenowitz, um, and she works actually in a different sphere of uh, revolutions and protest movements, which is you know, quite topical. Uh, and here's the statistic. She says, no government, she's done a lot of studies on this and looked at all these movements. No government has been able to withstand a challenge from 3.5% of the population. 3.5%, that's the tipping point. So I'm hoping that you know we're all part of that 3.5% uh, and let's make it happen. Thank hey, you. thank you. Thank you, Neela. So now I think we are all in agreement that um, behavioral science is a, is a bit weird, um, but we also see this weirdness sort of spilling over into the field as a profession. So for all the known benefits of leveraging and employing talent in this space of uh, behavioral and, and social science, um, the field still remains largely homogenous. And while you know, I personally can't control for many of the factors that uh, contribute to this disparity, uh, there is one area that uh, I, you know, I may be able to, to help close the gap. And I'll talk about that coming up in a minute. Um, the profound behavioral insight upon which this is based is you can't be what you don't see. So one hypothesis I have among many that are out there, I'm sure, is that this, this disparity, this lack of diversity in our profession um, stems from mental models that may constitute what is a real or legitimate science um, as part of what we call you know, STEM, 
the science, technology, engineering, and, and math. And these mental models may then shape decision making for uh, a more non traditional, if you will, career path. So, social science, it may not sound rigorous enough or scientific enough or hard enough you know, to be part of STEM. And even if one buys into, you know, yes, it, it does belong in there, what can one actually do with it? So enter exhibit A, that would be me. <laughs> so I knew from the time that I was about uh, four or five years old, and I am not making this up, I used to watch uh, Perry Mason on TV with my grandmother, and I knew that I was going to be a lawyer. And, uh, and, and, and I was pretty strong in this all the way through school. And so by the time I entered college, my major was pre-law. And I randomly picked psychology because you could, you could major in anything and then go into law school. And I was going to law school. Um, so I take psych 101 and by and large, I really like it, surprisingly so. I was, I was, I was really into it. And then one day, this teaching assistant, African-American teaching assistant came up to me. She wasn't even my teaching assistant for my section. Don't know why she picked me out, but she said, um, have you ever heard of engineering psychology? And I thought, no, I haven't. And she says, well, I think you should look into it. It may be something that interests you. And I just thought it you know, a little bit odd, but politely I said, okay. And then she left, and, and I promise you, I've not seen this woman since taking that Psych 101 class. But um, I did go and, and you know, to the to the psych office, and I looked up engineering psychology. And what do you know? It it did seem a, a, a bit interesting. And so um, I sort of stayed with it. And by senior year, um, I was completing an honors thesis in theories of automaticity. I had paired up with. Uh, one of the professors, Art Kramer, in, in uh, engineering psychology to, to do this. That teaching assistant coming to me to tell me about engineering psychology is my first recollection of a nudge. And it was a nudge that changed the choice architecture for me um, in terms of considering what might be um, a viable field in terms of in terms of a profession. Um, so I graduated with that degree in pre-law psychology. I promise the degree actually still says pre-law. I went on to graduate school in psychology and then on to work in the automotive industry and in and, and CPG for a number of years. And now finally at Coca-Cola, uh, where we leverage these principles of behavioral science uh, to inform our solutions that uh, refresh the world and, and make a difference. And, you know, all because of, of these nudges. Before graduating, actually, let me take one little step back. I asked my advisor, my thesis advisor um, in, in undergrad, I said, why does anybody care about these theories of, of automaticity in the real world? How would anyone use it? And he gave me a couple of examples. Um, and he says, well, but maybe that's something you can solve. And there, that was my second nudge, if you will. And so everything that I've done after that, my whole trajectory in, in this profession of behavioral science is a direct result of those two nudges in particular. And so I, I submit to you that at this, uh, this point in time where we have this lack of diversity in, in our profession, that we don't have to fall off the cliff over it. It may be as simple as each one of us, and that's what, 27 to 30,000 that's, uh, that's partic participating in this conference, uh, to identify the mental models of those underrepresented groups in our respective markets. Um, that may act as barriers to entry and then take the time to nudge them um, and change their choice architecture. And so I pledge, my commitment is to go back home. I am from Chicago. And so my commitment is to go back home to my high school, Hyde Park Career Academy on the south side of Chicago and bear witness to what is possible. If you can't be what you can't see, I need them to see what they can be. 
Um, and then, you know, I, I think that in terms of the, the profession as a whole, particularly for, um, for those, those private companies in, in our industry, I would offer three recommendations uh, for you to increase and, and help us close this gap in diversity that we have. One would be to work alongside your, um, your, diverse, your internal diversity networks. Um, oftentimes in companies will have, you know, the African-American network, the Asian network, the LGBTQ network, uh, the Latino ne network work alongside those to go into your community and provide that exposure um, to students when they are most impressionable, when they're thinking about what is it that I want to be when I grow up, and then pr and provide that exposure to the disciplines of behavioral science. And everyone doesn't have to be a psychologist. Within behavioral science, we have economists, we have uh, sociologists, we have anthropologists and neuroscientists. Um, but the exposure, that awareness, that nudge, if you will, I think will, will get us a long way. Number two, recruit uh, from HBCUs in the United States or uh, those, inter those institutions where you have a larger population of those underrepresented groups. And three, be deliberate in practicing unconscious bias in hiring. So I open it up to questions. I think all three Terrific. of us. Thank you. Yes, I've got some questions coming in into the audience. You can use Slido, um, Slido. We, uh, if you go to slido.com and look for nudge stock, type that in there, you'll hit our event and you can type in your questions. And I'm gonna go looking at those now. Um, first question that I'll pull up here is, <laughs> are behavioral scientists blind to their own biases? Says the questioner. And I'll, I'll let you, uh, you just indicate to me who wants to take each one of these questions. Go ahead for it, Grace. <laughs> Unmute yourself, Grace. There is a bias that's called bias blind spot that basically talks about the fact that just because we know about the biases doesn't necessarily mean that we don't succumb to them. So I can say for sure that behavioral scientists are do succumb to the same biases as everyone else. And I think when I spoke about hiring, I do encourage us as a profession to look at similarity bias, familiarity bias, halo effect in the same way as we would expect anybody else in another profession to do. Just because we know about it, doesn't mean that we stop it. Absolutely agree. We are, we are humans first. Mm -hmm. So yes, we are subject to the same biases. I just want to add in addition to the biases, it's the, um, the intent to action gap. So the same reason that we don't move on our diversity efforts is the reason we hit snooze on the alarm clock in the morning. Uh, we want to do it, it's just too much effort. So we push it back and it's too overwhelming. So I do think that's something that it's, it's not people don't want to do it. It's just getting from intent to action. The next question here is, what are your thoughts on recruitment quotas for diversity? Who'd like to tackle that one? So this, I, I can, I, okay. I, 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 okay. yeah, <laughs> I was going to leave it for Sarita because you're, you're in private yeah. company, but so do, do, do uh, contradict me if, if, if you think this is wrong. I mean, I think that quotas are only there when we're, we're not seeing heterogeneity anyway. So it gets us to a place that we need to be. I would prefer if it happened in a different way. So for example, I do a lot of work in financial and professional services firms, and it's much better for people to be hired, rec recognizing that the customers of these firms actually are extraordinarily diverse. So for example, they tend to be 50% men, 50% women, but we don't get that gender representation on boards and, uh, and in a lot of jobs and um, throughout the organizations. And without those quotas, we wouldn't move the boat because we had tried for many years and it didn't, it didn't actually happen. So I think it's a way to get us to a status quo, which is a good status quo for firms, but it would be better if we actually recognize the benefit and the value that people are bringing to the organization. I also think quotas help really to agree. force us to expand networks. So your default is the five people you know and the five people they know. And you know, this happened with us at the center as well. 
you don't intend to be homogenous, you end up being like that. Because especially when there's a time limit on hiring, you've got an urgent project, you'll just default to who you know best. And you, our networks you know, often tend up, end up being more homogenous than we realize. So it really forced us, we didn't have hard quotas, but it forced us to say, no, let's not just, just go with this person, but let's look further and let's actually push a little more and let's actually try and get different profiles in. Uh, and I, I agree with the value of diversity. It brings in new thought. Absolutely. There's a question. Uh, go ahead, Sarita. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, I, I agree. I agree with my peers here. And, you know, to the extent that we're um, taking the effort, making the effort to, um, to search for that talent and have them uh, have that, that, that representation of talent as, um, as part of the consideration set at the very least and then um, make sure that we are um, applying that, that, that those, those sort of tenets of unconscious bias when we are hiring, um, that more so than a quota per se um, is going to move us in the right direction of, of uh, having better or greater diversity. And you do need to be careful about backfire effects with quotas. So, um, and this is where data science can help us. So there's some evidence to suggest that the quotas here in London kind of led the, the daughters of the previous CEOs to be hired um, as compared to their sons. So you might then ask, is that true diversity? If we're kind of shifting towards everyone still being in the upper class, but just shifting across gender. So I think moderating whether or not there's crowd out effects across other groups becomes very important. Last question here. Any advice for the current Black Lives Matter protests to get meaningful change using behavioral science? For all three of you. So for me, it's about for people who are out there saying that they care about Black Lives Matter, where they have resources, that they're pledging those resources now. So their words are followed by a commitment to action that's visible and that can actually be followed up. Absolutely. And that's, I mean, that's why I think all of us, you've heard from all three of us talking about what we are committing to do. Um, so I think that, yes, it's, it's, it's awesome that, that money is being given, you know, to various organizations. We need to continue doing that. Um, but that needs to be very quickly followed with, with some actions as well. And my only thought is the three and a half percent, you know, let's have that sustained uh, participation. And what Sarita said about you can't be what you can't see. So it's incumbent on all of us who are non-Black to actually be out there so that it doesn't get seen as just, you know, a particular movement, but it's a universal movement. Well, Nudstock is very grateful for you to come here and talk about this. And I think more than talk, it's clear that in its eighth year, nudge stock is also just as guilty as the rest of behavioral science or many fields of science. And we genuinely take that on board. So beyond the talk, we look to your guidance going forward as well. So Sarita Bethay, Neela Saldana and Grace Lorden, thank you so much. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. And with that, we'll be back in just a minute.
welcome back to Nudge Stock. And if you've been following us for the last, oh, 12 hours, congratulations. In the words of the famed behavioral scientist, Lady Gaga, I was born this way. And our next two speakers are evolutionary psychologists, which is to say they think you were born this way because of natural selection and sexual selection. But they're gonna show you how a worldview that sounds like genetic determinism can actually give you leverage to improve your life and your relationships. The proof is they survived a 5,000 mile long distance relationship for four years, writing custom vows for their wedding last November, a honeymoon in China, and as the pandemic was starting, a three month lockdown in New Mexico, in the desert. Well, it sounds like a plot of a weird new sitcom, but it's nudge stock reality, folks. And to talk about how Darwinian self-awareness can make everyone better, here are evolutionary psychologists, Diana Fleischman and Jeffrey Miller. Welcome, newlyweds. Over to you. Hi. Hi. So I'm Diana Fleischman. I'm Jeffrey Miller. And we're evolutionary psychologists who happen to be married. Our field, evolutionary psychology, is a way of looking at the human mind as a set of adaptations that evolved to help our ancestors solve certain problems. Problems like finding food, avoiding predators, attracting mates, living in groups, and even showing off our virtues. These problems kept happening over and over and over for thousands of generations, and they shaped human nature. Evolutionary psychology isn't usually the first place that people think to turn to improve their lives. Often we think that if something evolved, then there's nothing that you can do about it, it's fixed. Or we think that because we have a feeling like preferences for people from our own country or jealousy or moral outrage, just because we feel things that those things are necessarily uh, good. But our mental states aren't fixed. The mind operates on cues from the environment. And if you know how your mind works, sometimes you can reframe things that are happening in the environment and change your own mind with that knowledge of how your evolutionary psychology works. So evolutionary psychology can sound like genetic determinism, but we think it can be really helpful because you learn to be skeptical about your motivations, rationalizations, and life stories, and to be skeptical about everybody else's. You can learn not to believe everything you feel. You can learn to go meta about your life. We think it's a Darwinian path to self-awareness. Today, we're going to give you four lessons on how evolutionary psychology can improve your life, including some ways that we actually think about our marriage and relationship through the lens of evolutionary psychology. Lesson one, there are good reasons for bad feelings. So when you feel anxious or depressed, angry or jealous, you might feel like something is wrong with you. But the common psychological narrative in pop psychology right now is that you have this kind of true, happy, confident self, and that's undermined by the message of society gives you or the, your parents give you or some kind of trauma. Uh, but the truth is, you know, that, that everybody has bad feelings. And, and when this, this pipe psychology narrative comes in, in addition to feeling bad, you also might be upset at the people who you feel created these bad feelings in yourself. Bad feelings we think aren't just imposed on us arbitrarily by parents, partners, society, circumstances, ideologies. Evolution created bad feelings to motivate us, to drive us to do behaviors that on average were good for getting our genes into the next generation. For example, anxiety can protect against dangers. Depression can solicit help from friends and family. These evolved emotions aren't perfect and they often misfire especially in modern environments that are quite different from the ones that we evolved in. If emotions are functional, and we think they are, then two ways to reduce bad feelings are to teach your brain that a bad feeling isn't actually necessary in modern life, or that it doesn't really work to achieve your goals. For instance, if you have a phobia about insects, bugs, you can do desensitization therapy, looking at pictures of insects, then handling them to teach your brain that most insects in modern life won't really hurt you. Your brain learns that it, the, the phobia wastes a lot of energy and attention and eventually lets it go. 
So most people are familiar that phobias can be desensitized, but you can actually desensitize yourself to other things as well. So the example of the old adage about what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So something like emotional jealousy, which can feel really terrible, can also be desensitized. And evolutionary psychologists hypothesize that the function of emotional jealousy is to keep a partner we value from leaving us or from divesting in us, that is taking away their attention, their resources or time. But emotional jealousy can also be desensitized. So if I see Jeffrey is still loving and attentive towards me after he's had a great conversation with an attractive woman, right? And I see that happen over and over again, then it could potentially desensitize my emotional jealousy and make it feel less bad. That's a way of showing your mind that the emotion isn't really needed to protect you from harms. But you can also teach your brain that the emotion isn't really useful in getting certain kinds of positive benefits. So anger is an, another really destructive uh, and negative emotion for the most part. And when we get angry over things, we can think that wasn't really very important in hindsight. That often happens when you get angry. And from my perspective, anger is a way of punishing a behavior that we don't want someone else to repeat in the future. And we get angry with people we love because the stakes are higher in terms of what their behavior is. And we know from behaviorism that if you want to get rid of a behavior, the punishment has to happen really soon after the behavior has happened. And that's why there's this you know, common thing to count either to 10 or 100 when you're angry. And that works because the further away you get from the behavior that you want to punish, the less effective the anger actually is. And so once you've counted to 100, the punishment you were going to dole out won't work as well anymore. And so you're less angry also as an adaptive function. There's also this mainstream idea in psychology and therapy that I think is, is pretty damaging, that it's important to blow off steam. It's kind of this cathartic Freudian model when you're angry, but this can be counterproductive because if you feel good when you blow off steam or if someone does what you want when you blow off steam, it's sort of showing your mind that the anger works. And that makes that anger more likely in the future. You're showing your mind that this behavior or emotion is getting you what you want adaptively. Sometimes in our relationship, our anger management gets pretty meta and pretty self-aware. For example, sometimes Diana gets angry at something I do and, or don't do or I'm not even aware of doing, and I want to apologize or soothe her, but she'll explicitly tell me, don't do it. Don't do that, don't soothe me, because it would only reinforce her anger and make her more likely to get angry in the future. It's kind of scary and counterintuitive to hold that line when you're facing an angry spouse, but it actually works to decrease the net anger in the relationship. Yeah, and that's because I have some awareness if I'm angry in the moment, but it's it's not really that useful. Also, one last thing is to say that Good Reasons for Bad Feelings is a book by Randy Nessie about this general topic, and we highly recommend it. So lesson number two is that behavior speaks louder than self-deception. The backstory is we all try to signal our good traits and our virtues to others. But this creates incentives for adaptive self-deception, for us to kind of believe our own PR stories. We all tend to think that we're smarter, more conscientious, and more virtuous than other people. This makes it hard to understand our own traits and behaviors objectively. Our actual behavior can be more informative than our subjective delusions. For example, if someone asks to borrow money from you, you could ask them directly, how likely are you to pay it back? or you could check their credit score. If someone claims they'd make a great boyfriend or girlfriend or spouse, you could just take their word for it, or you could go back and ask their exes about their relationship skills. It's not very popular to get a reference from the ex, is it? It should be though, why not? <laughs> so this is why we spend so much time getting to know other people and watching them in different contexts and scenarios. We figure out what other people are like, their attitudes, their personality, and their future behavior, not necessarily from what they say to us, but from observing their behavior over time and in different kinds of contexts in personal relationships. And often we don't really like it when people in personal relationships with us collect data on us rather than relying on our self-report because it makes it more difficult for us to present ourselves in a way that doesn't match reality. It makes it more difficult for us to present ourselves in a good light with our narrative, but actually behave in an alternative way. And uh, I saw two posts this year that kind of went viral online that illustrated this. In one case, this guy was kind of freaked out. He, his girlfriend went up to use the bathroom. He looked at her laptop and he saw that she had a spreadsheet about his behavior. And even though it was really nice, it was about things he liked and disliked and gift ideas for him. 
he was freaked out that she was systematizing this much, that she was trying to collect data in this way. Uh, and in another case uh, that also was widely discussed online, a man was frustrated that his wife was saying no to sex. So she claimed that she didn't always say no. So he started collecting data again in a spreadsheet of when he initiated sex and what happened. And uh, when she again said that saying no is not her normal thing, he presented her with the data. And uh, surprisingly, it didn't actually go that well for that guy. So in some sense, we don't want to get known too well, right? Because it keeps us from presenting ourselves one way and then behaving another way. We're all hypocrites, but we're afraid of being called out. And that's another reason why it's kind of creepy when even advertisers know a lot of information about you. It's creepy for people to know things that we haven't disclosed explicitly. So we should all do better than Google or Facebook. We should collect data about ourselves, our own behavior, our own past you know, patterns and habits um, to make our relationships better. Often we don't really know what we're like or how to predict our own behavior because we don't take this kind of outside view of our behavior. The way that a, a marketer or a therapist or your parole officer or your spouse would. The outside view can feel threatening and alienating at first, but we think it's a powerful way to leverage evolutionary psychology to improve your life. Lesson number three is that you don't want everything that you want, so. Another way that we don't really know ourselves is that inside of our own minds, we seem like a singular consciousness. But in fact, our minds are kind of like a messy, corrupt democracy. Our motives and preferences are like lobbyists competing to influence our policies and the decisions of our executive branch, our consciousness. So people often talk about this tension, for example, between parts of you that want short-term gratification versus those parts of you that are working towards more long-term goals. So locking yourself out of Uber Eats or your refrigerator if you're on a diet. I've heard about a woman keeping all of her makeup in her gym locker. So if she wants to wear makeup that day, she has to work out first. And writing this talk was a little bit scary because there are potentially tens of thousands of you watching. So I wrote a lot of this talk using an app called Freedom that ended up locking me out of the internet. I, one part of me, wanted to work on this talk today and make sure it was good for all of you. But I also really wanted to argue on Twitter, mostly with my brother, and do other things that were more fun and potentially lower stakes than this talk. People talk a lot about this conflict between short-term gratification or distractions versus long-term planning. And behavioral scientists study our failures of willpower and our short-sighted time preferences. But there are strategic conflicts within us that run even deeper, that are even more complicated and, and strategic. For example, in relationships, there's often a trade-off between wanting to, to maximize a partner's apparent mate value. So they'll seem attractive, valuable, and high status to us, and we can kind of feel worshipful and adoring, versus handicapping their mate value unconsciously. So they'll be kind of easier to control and less likely to leave us for someone else. Yeah, and this is a difficult tension for even people to talk about because, you know, this is the kind of thing that people really malign, but I think it's something that really is, is part of almost every relationship. Uh, so there's this tension that we have to manage in relationships between derogation and respect and between nurturing and, and punishment. Unfortunately, a punishing behavior can become a reward unto themselves. As I said, if you get what you want when you're punitive, that can become very rewarding. Um, and a woman might want her partner to become more decisive and confident, but she really enjoys questioning his competence. She really enjoys being right. And so in the moment, she doesn't realize that she's undermining these longer term goals. A man might want his wife to be more loving and affectionate, but he isn't rewarding the precursor to that affection, like talking to her about what's going on in her life, for example. And we recognize this tension in our relationship. Um, Diana sometimes makes unreasonable demands. Lots of people do. Well, the, the red-pilled pickup artists from the manosphere call this behavior shit testing. Um, you lose the test by giving in and doing what the woman wants, but then the woman loses respect for you and then you're both unhappy. But if both people understand what's going on with these counterintuitive tests, it actually makes the relationship much happier. Yeah, so similarly, you know, I, I like to, to tell him this is an unreasonable request um, or, you know, I'm, I'm just seeing what I can get. And I have some self-awareness about that. And it's difficult to get there because the shame and the guilt itself of that awareness makes it difficult to, to have conscious awareness. Um, another really good example is moods. So when you're angry or in a bad mood and there's something really bugging you, 
uh, you think that there's something really bugging you, but most of you have probably heard of being hangry, a combination of being hungry and angry. And one study found that the best predictor of a couple arguing was actually their glucose levels, how hungry they were. And this study did a really cool operationalization of spousal aggression by giving each spouse a little voodoo doll, like a little depiction of the other one. And the more hungry, lower the glucose levels were, the more pins that people put in the spouse doll, the more angry, uh, more aggressive they were towards their, you know, spouse doll. <laughs> so for, sometimes my brain actually turns low blood sugar into existential drama, a kind of alchemical transformation. I'll think everything is terrible. Our relationship needs work. I'll complain about something. Diana could take my grievances seriously and we could try to talk through our issues and end up in an argument. But the better solution is she'll remind me to eat something, wait half an hour, and then everything actually seems fine again. Yeah, or I'll just feed you. That I'll also works. You. Yeah. Uh, lesson number four is to curate the right cues. Your mind is an information processing system that uses environmental cues to sense what's going wrong and what's going right. Bad cues lead to bad feelings, good cues lead to good feelings. For example, during these interesting times, Twitter is a very effective way to feed your brain a flood of bad cues, cues that convince your brain everything is going badly in the world. And then that generalizes into your life and your relationships. We're not good at figuring out what really triggers bad moods. So you can end up unconsciously blaming your spouse for some Twitter comment made by a random troll. So most of you are probably well aware of an adorable woman called Marie Kondo and the wild success of the Marie Kondo uh, method. And that is keeping only things in your home that um, spark uh, joy. So for the better part of a year, I had this file on my computer desktop that reminded me of a funding application that I didn't actually submit on time. And I realized after a long time that every time I saw this file, it made me feel disappointed, sad, and incompetent. Uh, but I wasn't really attributing it to seeing that file on my desktop for a long time. I just felt that way and I didn't really know why. So it really could have undermined my motivation for a long time. And when I started seeing Diana, I realized I had a lot of physical things around me that reminded me of sad or poignant moments in my, my life. They were bad memory cues. And when I put them away in storage, my brain could let the past go more easily. So curating your cues is a way of using your personal knowledge of what makes you happy and unhappy to engineer your environment so it serves you instead of you reacting to it. Cues are an important reason of why lockdown was so difficult for many people. When in-person contact with other people is cut off abruptly, you get cues that you're being ostracized or abandoned or even canceled. <laughs> We're gonna, I think- No, 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 it's fine. No, 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 it's fine. Okay, well, we'll, we'll wrap up in a couple minutes. Also, Zoom calls um, can't replace that live social interaction and those, those natural social cues very effectively. One hack that we've discovered is if you're on a Zoom call with, with a bunch of people, you know, and most of them are, are flat and not really emoting towards you, pick the one person who's most engaged and just pay attention to that face. And then you'll get, you, you won't feel as ostracized by everybody else. Yeah, it's difficult to be talking to people and not getting any kind of uh, eye contact. I think that video conferencing could really figure that out. Um, relationships can also suffer when you're isolated, not only because you're relying on your partner for all your social needs, but also because it's more difficult to get cues that your partner is admired by others. It's easier to love and adore someone when you know that they're socially valued. That's just part of being a social primate. So it can be a good idea to curate cues that your partner is competent and important, especially when you're cut off from the outside world. So pay attention to when they're fixing something or exercising or talking about something they have expertise in. So you're not just getting cues of them eating bowls and bowls of cherry while watching uh, it's cherry season, it's cherry season. <laughs> so our takeaway uh, to wrap up is that evolutionary psychology we think offers new ways to see beyond your self-deceptions to understand the deep adaptive functions of your preferences emotions beliefs and behaviors it helps you understand the good reasons behind bad feelings how to take an outside view of your behavior how to take transient moods less seriously and how to curate the environmental cues in your life. In other words, we think that Darwinian self-awareness is the key to happier marriage and life. Terrific. <laughs> the Darwinian self-awareness. Listen, thank you both so much. We're beating the wire here for the audience. We're gonna be back in 15 minutes, but I have to say to you guys, that was not only fascinating, but um, 
the notion that a sex cell spreadsheet will not work and may backfire is a good note to take. And I was trying to think if you were in Hollywood, how you might in your cool, calm kind of how 2001 way, rewrite Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? I can't imagine how much you might destroy in Hollywood, which is totally governed by our out of control affect. But thank you so much. It's given us a ton to think about. It's very cool, and we really appreciate it. To the Nudstock audience, we're taking a break and changing over our feed. Stay with us. We'll be back in 15 minutes with Kai D. Wright, Laurie Santos, and a bunch of others. Thank you so much, Diana and Jeffrey. <laughs>